Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'd like to um, call a meeting to order. And first, before we do that, I'd like to pass it over to our corporate officer in regards to an announcement on our public hearing. Brenda? Thank you. Good morning. Um, the original notice for the June 28th public hearing included an error regarding the length of time that metal storage containers could be used as temporary storage for the purpose of moving for a maximum of 90 days. And this should have read 45 days. So the advertisements are being republished and the public hearing regarding this bylaw is rescheduled to 9 a.m. on July 19th. Thank you, Brenda. You're welcome. So at this point, we'll call the regular meeting uh, to order with uh, our Committee of the Whole. And our first um, order of business this morning is a delegation, Joanna Martins, uh, Executive Director of the Kiwanis Performing Arts Centre, and Teresa Gladu are in attendance. Regarding a pro proclamation for June 21st as Nat National Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, we missed this on, on our last uh, council meeting, and obviously it is uh, behind us, but we wanted to absolutely uh, take the opportunity this morning to... Uh, do the proclamation and we appreciate now for the first time that we're allowed to have uh, delegations back in person in council and so it's a real uh, pleasure to have Johanna and uh, Teresa joining us this morning. So I will read the proclamation and um, turn it over. So toao tansei, manando. Piguanea, kinas kuntan. <laughs> Not well, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> Whereas the Constitution of Canada recognizes the existing rights of the Indigenous people of Canada, and whereas in the Constitution of Canada, Indigenous peoples of Canada include the Indian, Inuit, and Métis people of Canada, and whereas the Indigenous people of Canada have made and continue to make valuable contributions to Canadian society, and it is considered appropriate that there be, in each year, a day to mark and celebrate these contributions to recognize the different cultures of the Indigenous peoples of Canada. And whereas many Indigenous people celebrate the summer solstice, which has, has an important symbolism within their culture, and whereas the Governor General of Canada has proclaimed June 21st of each year as National Indigenous Peoples Day, now therefore I do hereby proclaim June 21st, 2021 as National Indigenous Day, uh, Peoples Day in Dawson Creek. So thank you guys so much for being here this morning. We appreciate it. Uh, we, uh, with pride, obviously, as a proud member of the Métis Nation of British Columbia to be here and read this proclamation today. And, with that, we'll turn it over to Teresa for a few words. Just a few? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I just can ask Um Tyndale. Thank you for acknowledging this, but I think somewhere along the line, we're going to have to change it to Indigenous History Month and then maybe change that language where it says Indian. But yeah, because we're, we, uh, we celebrate through the whole, the whole month. And I think it would be great if we could just change that maybe for next year. But we had, we at KPAC had a really good uh, week. We had the whole Indigenous week where we had beading uh, contributions of the Indigenous and dancing and singing. So it was really, really great. And then the Nalakin Friendship Center had a really great opening with uh, our exhibition powwow and of course the residential school exhibition that they had. I think Johanna wants to say a few words now. Thank you, Teresa. Yes, thanks. So excited to be back in council with you guys. <laughs> um, so we are very excited that this was our second annual Indigenous Day Festival and hopefully next year we will be in person because that's the whole point is to be gathered together. But just a quick update on another project that I was here a while ago uh, in regards to our pillars of the community. Throughout our Indigenous week here, we actually got the picture that was painted for that pillar done and presented in our lobby. So our next step is to actually go and wrap it. So we thought it was really important to have that piece done uh, for last week for Indigenous Week. Um, so if anyone is in our centre, please come down and take a look at it because that will be our first pillar here the next few weeks that will get wrapped. But awesome. painting's on display for now. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so we're really excited that things are opening up as well. So we'll have lots of exciting things and lots of events happening this summer. Thank you, Joanna. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Teresa, for being here this morning. It's really nice to have uh, you guys here. And obviously, uh, the first time we've been able to have delegations back in council in person. And it's uh, hopefully 
opening us up even more for the future. So thank you. Thank you. Can I ask them ten? Our next delegation is um, Mr. Brian Mitchell, Land and Resource Specialist on the Caribou Recovery Program, who is in attendance in uh, via Zoom and going to do a presentation to Council regarding the draft winterized, uh, winter motorized recreation management plan in the South Peace. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to um, Awesome. So I, we have Brian and Heather uh, joining us this morning and uh, as I uh, introduced the Caribou Recovery Program and they'll be presenting this morning on the draft uh, motorized recreation management plan. Good morning, Heather and Brian. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning and we'll turn it over to you. Brian, I believe you're on mute, maybe. Uh, can you hear me? There you are. Thank you. Sorry about that. You were on mute right when I joined so that I didn't hear you ask me to start presenting. <laughs> I'm very sorry for that. Thank you that so much. <laughs> we'll pass it over to you. The floor is yours. Perfect. I'll flip up my screen now. And thank you for your patience. All right, I trust you folks can see my screen okay? Yes, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Um, so thanks so much for the opportunity to come present to Mayor and Council today. Um, I trust that you folks have already had an opportunity to review the pre-recorded presentation that I provided on May 28th. Um, and today the specific presentation at your request is on the goals, um, the success indicators and the sort of milestones and that time frame of those milestones um, of this draft management plan. And so fundamentally, we understand that caribou are displaced, disturbed, and there's an opportunity for increased predation um, in terms of their interactions between winter motorized recreation um, and the individual animal caribou. Um, and so fundamentally, the goal is to sort of mitigate these components. And so how um, we propose to do that is outlined within the partnership agreement, as you folks know, um, and we're looking to complete a collaborative design and implementation process with the parties of the partnership agreement. The, de the development and implementation of that is completed in consultations with First Nations, technical experts, local governments, and the Stoneville sector. Um, and that in order to sort of complete those uh, reductions in disturbance, displacement, and increased predation, there may be opportunities for closures, enhancements, and other measures that are consistent with similar plans in BC. And so you folks have already seen this slide. And I think this really sort of outlines what our objectives as the province of British Columbia are as it pertains to this matter. And so with the fundamental objective of that shared recovery objective being within the partnership agreement, it made sense that the primary objective of this draft management plan, the primary goal is to development management plan that would support the achievement of the shared recovery objective. And so, in, in order to sort of execute that, there would be a number of, you know, specific to the clause 37, things like closures and other measures that are consistent with, the pro with other plans in BC could be implemented. However, recognizing the utmost importance of winter motorized recreation, not only to the residents of the South Peace, however, also the visitors and the visitor use economy, the province of BC is, is really looking to both maintain the highest use and highest value recreation opportunities throughout the region, as well as to support the development or enhancement of the winter motorized recreation destinations. So these objectives, as they're set out within the draft management plan, are our goals of this management plan moving forward. And so with these sort of goals outlined here on this slide um, and in the draft management plan, we could then start looking at success indicators as you folks requested. So for that primary goal, looking at caribou populations and achieving the shared recovery objective, we can use quantitative metrics like caribou population trends, 
so we can complete surveys on an annual basis and observe how caribou populations are responding to our prescribed management actions. We can observe things like calf recruitment, um, caribou presence or reoccupation of habitat. So currently underutilized habitat, we can observe if they reoccupy it, which would be great. Um, we can observe if there's direct displacement, if, if snowmobiles and caribou are interacting on the land base in some of the locations that we're still recommending to stay open. We can observe if there's a change in habitat use over time. We can observe you know, through telemetry data, both caribou and wolves, the interactions between caribou and predators to see if those interactions are decreasing throughout the, throughout the region or if they're increasing. And we can observe sort of quantitatively how many linear disturbances exist on the landscape um, so, and in order to sort of minimize those and reduce predation across the landscape, things like the creation of maintenance of trails into areas that aren't open for winter motorized recreation could help, um, you know, be a proxy indicator on sort of that primary objective. Now, switching gears into the two secondary objectives specific to motorized recreation because of the importance of the communities, we can observe visitation um, of winter motorized recreation in open areas. So implementing things like traffic counters and understanding visitor use trends and intensities in the areas that are retained open. Um, we can observe if there's an increase in those areas that maybe that's a success indicator in that we're still maintaining a diversity of opportunities um, as well as uh, high value ones because people still wanna go there. Um, we can also observe you know, winter motorized recreation club memberships. If they increase over time, that's a good sign. That would indicate that likely um, there's, there's interest in the sport and that it's continuing to grow. Um, and we can observe if there's growth in the winter motorized recreation visitor economy. And moving on into the secondary objective, success indicators would be, again, continued growth of the use economy, as well as if there's individual use within these enhanced and developed areas. If that increases throughout time, that could be indicated as a success. And specific to these last two secondary objectives, one may be able to sort of extrapolate that if we have high levels of compliance, um, that that would not only be a success indicator for the primary objective, but it could also indicate that if we have high levels of compliance, there's likely high value recreation on the landscape and a diversity of that. So folks aren't looking for opportunities that aren't um, afforded to them through the regulated regulation measures. And so moving away from those success indicators into sort of our milestone framework, it's really set out within the adaptive management plan uh, or um, adaptive management sort of commitment of the draft management plan. And so if the province of British Columbia moves forward with implementation in the fall of 2021 with the current plan and the current adaptive management um, commitment, that we would be completing ongoing intensive and extensive monitoring for all of those success indicators. So completing um, annual surveys for caribou population trends, looking at compliance, reviewing visitor, visitor use economy statistics and that sort of thing and metrics. And we'd be able to compare and understand how these prescribed management actions are influencing our goals and these success indicators. As outlined within the draft management plan, at the end of two years, so the summer of 2023, um, we review sort of the, the monitoring information in the most um, in the most high risk areas. So places where we currently have current occupancy of caribou and we're prescribing that snowmobiling is maintained and can, can continue within those areas, um, we would make sure that the prescribed measures such as education and signage and that type of thing is still achieving sort of our goals of the management plan. In 2023, in these higher risk areas, if we identify that we're just not achieving some of these primary objectives, that there could be an opportunity to work with local snowmobile clubs um, to improve the management measures. Um, and in a sort of the worst case scenario, there could be an opportunity for further engagement and adaption of the management measures in terms of the regulatory lens. So after the, sort of this initial two year review in these highest risk areas, we would then be sort of falling into a regular four-year adaptive management cycle. And so completing ongoing intensive and extensive monitoring. So um, monitoring recreation visitor use uh, intensities, monitoring caribou populations, monitoring wolf movements and that sort of thing throughout the landscape. Um, and then at the end of every four years, working with local snowmobile clubs 
working with others that are interested and trying to identify opportunities to continually improve and ensure that we're achieving those three fundamental goals of improving caribou populations, maintaining use of high value and a diversity of recreation opportunities and providing opportunities for the enhancement or development of new recreation opportunities. And I would continue, I don't have a little um, roundabout diagram, but you know, 2025, 2029 and so on until we achieve that primary goal of the shared recovery objective. And so noting that we only had 10 minutes, that was pretty, pretty high fly, quick overview. I trust because that was a lot of information that you folks have a number of different questions. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to stay on the line for as long as needed um, to be able to provide that opportunity for you folks. So ask away. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so to council, questions, comments? Councillor Earl, or Councillor Dober. Oh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, I just had a couple questions. When you're doing the, like the caribou population control, and you're doing the surveys over the years um, about the snowmobiling and the recreation out there that could be affecting it, like, is there any monitoring of other major risks to the animals, like predators and, you know, protected predators that are growing in population? Like, do you look at all areas or is it just recreation? Yeah, really great, great question, Councillor. Um, I'm not a, a caribou biologist, so I'm not sure the specific uh, of the sort of monitoring plan. From a recreation side of things, I can speak to that we do have um, traffic counters on a number of the recreation sites and trails branches, um, trails throughout the region, and some of those are snowmobile trails. And so we understand recreation intensities in some areas. Through population surveys and the predator management program that you folks are also probably aware of, we can also monitor sort of predators on the landscape. Historically, if you're, I, I think your question was maybe asking about types of predators and what their impacts are to caribou. Um, in the South Peace, wolf predation is sort of the primary driver there. However, my understanding is that there is an, a survey that's just getting going this year, looking at uh, bear predation, both grizzly and black bear predation on caribou calves. And so as you know, the scientific process unrolls, we'll be able to better understand the impacts of predation from all species on caribou throughout the region. Also in terms of industrial impacts and disturbance impacts from um, you know, sound and that sort of thing, I, I do believe that there is ongoing monitoring and you know, footprint monitoring and just disturbance thresholds could also be an indicator of that. Um, Councillor, because I'm not a caribou biologist, I'd be happy to be able to follow up to provide a more fulsome answer on sort of our breadth of monitoring throughout the region. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you very much, uh, Brian, for your time here today. Uh, so I've got a few questions, um, I, and I appreciate the, the review uh, presentation. So I, I did, I, I think a lot of the content within that presentation was initially covered in the, the document you sent us. I was more, and on behalf of some of my constituents who've expressed concern, um, the lack of specific mm -hmm. metrics relayed in there. So for instance, um, in the, I think it was 2013 document on caribou recovery, the objective as stated in the document was to reach, uh, I think it was equal to or greater than 1,200 animals within 20 years. Um, so when I, I made the request that we get some metrics, it was more aligned with that in mind to give people some measurable idea of what this looked like. Similarly, um, when, you know, you make a statement of uh, the primary goal is to see uh, the, the herd levels or number of, of animals within the herd increase, um, is that consistent with, I think it was, we're currently seeing a 15% per year, year over year in increase in uh, population. Is that the idea of moving forward to accelerate that if it falls below that is it still increasing and it's so just just those kind of metrics um, specific to what uh, what people can expect and then um, one other piece of feedback that has been relayed to me and I'm not admittedly uh, an outdoor recreate well I hike and stuff but not uh, so much a motorized piece but um, they've advised that some of the closures, um, the, the areas that are closed off themselves aren't so much problematic, 
as to where the closures occur also interfere with um, people's ability to access uh, are other areas which aren't necessarily closed off. So while in practicality you may have closed off 30% of the area, or in technically only 30% of the area may be closed off, in practicality 70% of the area is inaccessible. I was just wondering if um, this plan or there's any, and, and this may be outside your wheelhouse, so I apologize, but um, if there's any intention to provide some resources to um, allow uh, access routes to be made so that that area which is no longer accessible but technically accessible is going to be practically accessible. I'm sorry, that was a bit of a word salad. No, I, I appreciate that, Councillor. And I think just to reiterate, so your first question was specific about sort of, you know, individual sort of quantifiable metrics in terms of what our goals are here. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that question was specific to sort of the prescribed management actions or recommended management actions within this draft management plan. Um, you know, there's, there's some areas that are retained as open and there's impacts in our prescribed regulation that would impact historical accesses. So I'll touch base on both of those. Um, so the first one pertaining actual metrics, um, I believe you're accurate. I haven't read the 2013 document for a long time, but yes, I think it said greater than or equal to 1,200 animals. Um, you know, fundamentally what we need to do in the South Peace and British Columbia's commitments and the right thing to do is to achieve self-sustaining populations. So right now, yes, we're seeing high levels of growth or good levels of growth throughout the region. I mean, we've generally stabilized a lot of the populations. However, that's with really significant human interaction in terms of we're, we're um, in terms of the predator management program, where we're effectively eradicating 100% of wolves in high elevation winter habitat in the winter, and we have a maternity penning project that the caribou population is seeing good growth, but it's with a lot of human intervention at the moment, and so we need to see the transition to the caribou populations being self-sustaining without these sort of human interventions to be able to, you know, have a better indicator of, of what the self-sustaining population is. Um, so I apologize, I don't have a specific metric. Again, that's another thing that maybe we can follow up with. I'll connect with my colleagues in the caribou program um, to, to better identify that for you. Um, and then specific to areas that are sort of, you mentioned that there's a number of locations in the prescribed management plan that would still be open to recreation opportunities. However, the access is impeded with the regulation. This wasn't our intent, and we're learning a lot of information through this engagement process. And I'll use the example of the Wolverine, where we weren't aware of an area called Rogers Pass. We thought it went through Valley Bottom, and it turns out that it went higher up on the slope, and our prescribed measure actually impacts that recreation access. And so through this engagement process, we're being able to sort of verify both the information that was provided by the South Peace Home Advisory Committee in terms of the spatial data that we used and making sure and sort of checking, you know, checks and balances to make sure that what we're recommending would still work for the recreation sector. And so um, in terms of changes, you know, that type of engagement is really important to inform the final recommendations to the minister when they make that decision. Thank you, Brian. Uh, anything further, Councillor? I'm um, good to know, Your Worship. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, uh, so uh, I guess the um, certainly the feedback f for uh, me in terms of uh, the original um, origination of our first discussions, I, the, this came to uh, a discussion certainly to us in the uh, South Peace or in the Northeast was probably three or four years ago. Um, and throughout the time of that, it's been um, frustrating that we at local government have been saying, look, all we wanted was a place at the table and and in order to be able to provide that input and and throughout uh, the commitment was that um, we were going to be involved, included, and that didn't come to pass. The partnership agreement was signed, um, leaving local government on the side. And, and now as we watch the uh, caribou, um, the, sorry, the, uh, Committee on uh, Winterized uh, Motorized Recreation um, and the feedback I've certainly heard from uh, our local uh, snowmobile groups as well as other users is that um, that entire year of discussion and input was disregarded basically um, by um, 
the government province uh, and through the partnership agreement moving forward with it. The, the hard part for me, and I heard this from uh, a number of our local community folks, I don't think anybody's um, at, in any way saying that we're not concerned or care about the recovery of the caribou, but the local users, the people who are out there using the backcountry um, the most, are usually these um, um, winterized, um, motorized uh, groups. They know um, what they're doing, where they're going, and and to me, I think that's a piece of this. That uh, and I I understand the partnership agreement with the federal government, the provincial government, and uh, West Moberly and Soto. But to me, this whole aspect of disregarding and and not in, and not engaging the and I don't want to use the term not engaging, but not taking. Um, the value of what these local folks can do and trying to find a way to collaborate and work with them to say here's the areas that are critical habitat and area for uh, the caribou in terms of their both winter and summer ranges and habitat protection and, and all of that stuff along with the predator control that's uh, the wolf call that's going on uh, to me that's the piece that I'm hearing from folks and and it's an important segment from our community and our region about folks um, who know and are on the land all the time and and that's the worry I have going forward is the um, committee's worked for a year and it doesn't uh, sound as though that uh, frustration that I'm hearing from them. Um, so Brian, I, and I appreciate your role in this is um, rolling it up through the channels. This is a much larger conversation uh, for us as um, a community and a region. And there isn't a question there, it was a statement. If I may, um, I'm also able to join today. My name is Heather Weave. I'm the director of the Caribou Program. And Mayor and Council, absolutely, I, I understand the concerns that um, perhaps not all the recommendations that were made by the South Peace and Mobile Advisory Committee were able to be brought forward in their whole. Um, I do, however, believe that their input and the discussions that we've had ongoing for the past year have been of utmost value. I'm sure everyone on the call can understand that there are some people at um, the discussions for Caribou that would like to see full closures. If we didn't have this excellent work from the South Peace Snowmobile Advisory Committee, we would not have had that check and balance conversation to be able to bring forward the values of the local citizenry. We really would have been going into those conversations blind. So I understand there's frustrations that I know that group would have liked to have seen their entire report adopted as written. Uh, we did need to go farther in some areas for caribou recovery, but uh, if you are in conversations with your citizenry, and we are saying this in every call that we're having, is those conversations were of utmost value. Again, it was that check and balance that we just wouldn't have had without that input. Thank you, Heather. So anything further, Council? Councillor Parslow, go ahead. Good morning. I just have a, a question. Um, I'm Obviously, I follow the studies on climate change uh, quite closely. Um, but let's say by uh, what, what long-term uh, studies have been done on climate change and its impact on the, on the range of caribou and the effect on the natural food sources? Brian, I can take that one too if you don't, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, definitely lots of conversation around climate change. We are having um, a provincial-wide conversation at this moment talking with the different groups that are having land use planning, whether it's modernized land use planning, wildlife, um, together for wildlife, caribou. We need more on that, to be honest, um, Councillor. It, it's important for us to be able to understand the impacts. What we were starting to see out of some of the, the literature and some of the studies is really a focus on the southern landscape. And we've asked for a switch in that to make sure that we're looking at the northern landscape in the same way. I think there's a general thought out there, and I think it's a misperception that they'll have more significant impacts in the south. But what our initial modeling is showing us is that the impacts in the north will be just as significant or even more so. So we are working with the Office of the Chief Forester to develop a more significant um, model and conversation, again, across the whole province versus just for caribou, because it's a, it's a larger issue. So agree that there's um, a lot of need for focus there, and we're putting efforts into it this year. Thank you so much. Um, 
I see nothing further. So thank you uh, both Heather and Brian uh, for coming in this morning and uh, presenting to council. We appreciate your uh, time and obviously appreciate uh, the information that you've provided both to council and to uh, the folks who follow us today on um, social media. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So our next uh, delegation, 2.3 this morning, we have Chelsea Lamont, uh, property owner at 9412 8th Street, in attendance. Not here, Brenda? Yeah, through your worship, we have tried to contact her and uh, just left a message. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything on late items? New councillor business, councillor Parslow, 4.1. Yes, I introduced this at the last council meeting. And so you have before you a, a proposed motion, which I'll read, that the South Peace Historical Society be asked to develop and to maintain a list of the mayors of Dawson Creek with a short biography of each mayor and the length of service to the community. Further, the list be made available through social media. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Dober, uh, discussion. Okay. Councillor Parslow, go ahead. I think I shared that whilst I was visiting uh, my daughter in Kelowna, uh, I was at a gathering of at Dawson Creek residents, and we could find, they were asking all sorts of questions, and nowhere could we find on on social media any reference to the to this this question. And being a history buff, I think it's important to to be able to research things about your home community. And uh, so it was a result of that discussion that I put this forward. Thank you. Staff Brenda, you had mentioned we have a bit of information. Yes, through your worship, we do have a database that lists all mayor and councils from the beginning of the, the when the village was first um, incorporated. So um, we could include that information as well so we'll have that available for the historical society if they wish to um, and then carry forward and uh, any further information that they would put together with that good good thank you further discussion ready for the question all in favor opposed it's carried thank you I do have some new business. go ahead councillor Parzal I took part in the uh, Northeast RAC, which is the advisory committee for NDIT. And um, I'm just going to share, if I may, the, the awards that were made. I usually just mention the, the South Peace, but I, I really want to, want to read the list so that uh, staff and councillors in the interaction with the community uh, are aware of the sort of the things that are, are receiving significant financial support. I'm going to start off. The Whiskey Jack Nordic Ski Club Day Lodge received a grant of $298,396 for that project. The Fort Nelson Motocross Track Upgrade Phase 2 of that project, $97,187. Here's a Dawson Creek one. The Ken Boric Aquatic Center flooring and change room lockers, City of Dawson Creek. We received $117,937. The Global Geopark Interpretive Center, Tumblr Ridge, that project received a $300,000 grant. The Commercial Hydroponic Greenhouse System for the Soto First Nation received a grant of $135,875. The Tumblr Ridge Residential Development and Diversification Study, District of Tumblr Ridge, received a $5,000 grant. Here's a good one for us, Bear Mountain Ski Hill Facility Improvements. Uh, for the Dawson Creek Ski and Recreation Association, $99,527, which was a huge uh, relief for our councillor to act off there. The Kinarina washrooms and change room upgrades, another uh, grant to the city of Dawson Creek, 66506 The Chetwin Spray Park Outdoor Restroom, $30,000 grant. The Fire Lake Playground for the Soto First Nation, a $30,000 grant. The Deck and Breezeway construction for the Dawson Creek Sportsman's Club, 
$30,000 grant. Chetwin Community Garden Greenhouse, a $10,000 grant. Main Street Revitalization Planning, the Northern Rockies Regional Municipality got a $20,000 grant. And finally, the Tumbler Ridge Digital Marketing the, for the District of Tumbler Ridge, a $3,500 grant. So there were all the grants. My understanding is that uh, the next intake uh, may not happen because there's been such a, a good use of the, in the uh, a large number of things are awarded. But I have a question for staff because one of us, well, ours, I'm talking the city, got, uh, I, we expected it to be on this list and it didn't happen. Do we have any further information why and is there a chance that it might get looked at before the, in time for the project? Go ahead, Blair. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you to Council. So we have been checking. We did send it in to NDIT. We have had our IT staff look at it. It did go and leave our system. They are in the process of investigating with the other end as to why it uh, either got there and was not noticed or didn't get there. So there is some uh, technological glitch. Uh, we're hopeful that if it is on the other end and somehow it was missed by the Northern Development Initiative Trust, that they would entertain uh, looking at that grant application. So. And that was for the tennis yes. courts and okay. pickleball and pickleball, all that. Pickleball, basketball, that yes. yes. Thank you. Which is a, an important project yeah, for us. Yeah, for sure. Very. So we're Thank working you. on that, but it did leave here. Yeah. So. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further? No. Good. Councillor Dober. Thank you, Worship. Um, I just had two things. Um, one, I guess, to probably Kevin, but um, I've just been, like, I go out, walk, and bike the community lots, and I've noticed the sidewalks are lifting a lot. <laughs> I, I'm assuming it's from the hot wet weather. Um, and I get concrete lasts longer than Asheville, but then I, last night, was uh, riding by Central, and their sidewalks are all asphalt, and they're probably the nicest sidewalks in town. And I'm assuming it's more affordable to do asphalt. Is there a reason... Um, like why we went to asphalt there, and is it something that's, you know, you're looking at for the future? Or? Yeah. Don't so through your worship, um, the heat is definitely causing some heaving of the concrete, and we see that typically, or often <laughs> when we get this, uh, when we get warm weather. Uh, so we've got a few in the community, and it's just the expansion, and then it it finds a spot and it'll lift. So we'll have to go out and repair that. Um, our standard is concrete for sidewalks. Where we've used asphalt is more of a, what we consider a wider multi-use path. And the reason we do asphalt is simply because those paths are considerably wider and just, you know, uh, the expense of concrete is, is uh, a little bit uh, prohibitive. So that's why we, we use that as a standard for the multi-use paths. So, um, but concrete will last, last longer for sure. Asphalt's more susceptible to, to rutting and or as you've seen on the walking trail, you'll get uh, dandelions, unfortunately, and weeds pop up through it as well, so. Is the cost saving from asphalt to concrete, like does it outweigh the length of the, the life of it? Mm. Or is it? There is, uh, there's definitely a cost savings. I don't have it off the top of my head, obviously, but you're, you're gonna see a savings on, on the asphalt, on the longevity of it. Um, you know, a typical concrete sidewalk you know, if it's constructed properly in the first place, should last, you know, 30, 40 years without much of a, a hiccup. Uh, yeah. Where where asphalt, you know, is probably not going to, it's not going to last that long. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, Councillor? Yeah, I had one other thing. I, I'm just not sure about motion, so maybe I'll just bring this up, and if I need to make a motion, I just wanted to talk a little bit about... Um, um, our law enforcement being complaint based. I know I've brought it up before about having it, you know, switch from being complaint based because I don't see a lot of positive in it. I see, um, you know, it's only complaint based, so it's negative. Like you're getting comments all the time instead of being proactive and having, you know, one or two people out in the community that are, you know, being proactive and they're, you know, checking people's lawns, make sure they're done, you know, the cleanliness of yards, like we had a letter and, you know, or businesses, or, you know, I think there's a bylaw that after a business opens, it needs to be paved within a year. Like, having somebody more proactive 
that would help beautify the city and make it, you know, cleaner and crisper. So I don't know if, like, if I need to make a motion to have staff look into, you know, what what that would be. Because I know Blair, I've talked to Blair about it before, and he said, that, you know, it would involve more staff. But I'd like to learn more about that because, you know, I think there's could be a way of doing it with the same amount of staff. So, so uh, we would it would require a notice of motion that you would bring it back it would have to become uh, as part of our new procedures that you would have to bring it it would have to come forward but what we could do is if you like is be happy to sit down with you yourself uh, with Blair and I okay. we can go through the policy and how that works and then if you decide you want to move forward with it then we'll help you with a motion to bring it back for council to give that direction okay that sounds good okay good thank you uh, next up we have Councillor Earl Thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to take a moment to report back to my colleagues on council about the um, uh, Northeast uh, Regional Community Foundation or uh, Northeast BC Regional Community Foundation. I attended their annual general meeting last week as my well, as a representative there for the city of Dawson Creek, and I congratulate them on a successful year for uh, the information of council in two thousand or in twenty twenty. Um, NERF distributed uh, $200,789 within the piece to 18 organizations, uh, which went towards 23 different community projects. And of that 200 some odd thousand dollars, 149,000 was here in Dawson Creek to support services throughout the region. So congratulations to them on some good work. Some of that is from uh, their own endowment and the, the interest from that, others uh, have to do with the fact that now that the organization is up and running with staff and, and some infrastructure, they are being tapped by other community foundations and organizations throughout Canada and BC as a, um, don't use the word middleman, but essentially um, as, a, as a, yeah, providing that service and allocating those funds. So it's been, uh, I think, a very fruitful year for them. Um, and that help was much needed. So congrats to them once again. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kempf. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just wanted to take a moment and thank the staff at the pool, the Kenbrook Aquatic Center. Um, about two weeks ago, I believe, I signed up for, or tried to sign up for swimming lessons for my children. Um, woke up at six in the morning, got on the site, and I unfortunately was not able to um, secure any spots. Every time I put it in the cart, someone else bought it, and so it was that bit. Um, it sold out in like seven minutes, but um, they put me on a waiting list. I was able to secure um, three spots for my kids. So I just wanted to say, you know, despite the program that we use, um, the staff is um, phenomenal there and they were able to um, meet my needs. So I just wanted to say thank you very much um, to them for that. It was very well done. My only question is, is there a reason why we have to sign up at six in the morning? Maybe just kind of a question and also if there's a different system that we could possibly use. Um, that program is very not user friendly um, and it's quite stressful actually. I've tried two times to get in and haven't been successful. I guess my question is just why we use that particular program. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shante? Through your worship. So we are, since we've had that discussion with you, we are reviewing it. We are in the process of changing from the system that we currently have. Uh, one of the reasons why they went in at six o'clock was just gave an opportunity for people to go and register. We are looking at changing that so that you register online and in on phone at the same time, but we're going to go through that process. We're working through that right now for the next time that we do registrations. And we are changing our system. It is currently will be up and running probably October 1st, and it's called Perfect Minds. Ah, oh, perfect. I just think, you know, there's a great need and stuff for it, and I just wish there was more spots that people could get because it's such a great service that you offer at the pool. So, And we're limited with the swim lessons, but we're so grateful that people like them, And but seven minutes is yeah. a lot for the whole summer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Shante. Um, anything else, Council? Thank you. So we'll go to item five minutes, uh, adoption of the minutes of a regular meeting of council for June 14th for adoption. Move, Councillor Kemp, second, Councillor Earl. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Is there any business arising from those minutes for anyone? 
correspondence, 7.1. We have a letter from Tanya Stettel, our grant writer, in regards to uh, UBCM 2021 Asset Management Planning Program grant. Councillor Parslow. I'd like to move that the you, City of Dawson Creek supports the grant application wish. to Sorry. the 2021 Asset Management Program for City Buildings through the UBCM Asset Management Planning Program for a grant of up to 15000 to develop an asset management policy and plan. Thank you. Do you have a seconder? Ralph well, Blair? So let Once a second. Could I have a seconder? Councillor Earl? Go ahead, Blair. Your Worship, if at this time I would request uh, Council to table this motion now that it's been moved. This is uh, premature coming to Council. Uh, we've just found out through the asset management side of things. We've just received an FCM asset management. We're trying to coordinate uh, this oh, okay. one. So it came early, okay. and I apologize for that. So a motion to table the motion would be in order, at which time we will have it lifted uh, at a future date. Okay. Thank you. So a motion to table. Councillor Dober, second. Councillor Kemp, all in favour? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, 7.2, we have a letter from Christina Riglietti and Michael Charbonneau, residents of Dawson Creek, requesting uh, for reduce or waiving their rezoning fees uh, at 940 189th Avenue. And I think we just dealt with this at our last meeting, the request. Councillor Javekov. Uh, I'll make a motion that we deny the request. Thank you. Second. Councillor Earl. Discussion. Blair. Your Worship. So, following up on this, there the letter is pretty self-explanatory from the author of it. Um, I think that our departments do a good job, but this is uh, an interesting. Um, subdivision where I understand if you look at the map to the north, the street to the north is RS2. Uh, the street that this home was on was all RS1, I believe. Um, they are requesting it so that they can have their basement suite and put in, but they're also indicating that had they known originally when they built the house, they may have opted. I believe the lot was purchased as zoned RS1. There would have had to be a rezoning at the time to meet this, if I understand this correctly, Kevin. Um, so that is really okay. it is a request to rezone uh, with the waiving of a fee request as well attached to it. Thank you. So. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, 7.3, we have a letter from Michelle Pickett, Executive, uh, Executor of Estate for Donna Stanick at um, 1820 uh, Willowbrook Crescent in regards to Creek Bank Erosion. Councillor Javekov, I'm having trouble seeing your light. Go ahead. I'll make a motion that we deny this request. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Earl, discussion. Go ahead, Councillor Javekov. Yeah, this uh, stream, the, the erosion resulting from this stream is not really a... a issue that's city related it's uh, the stream is a provincial stream and uh, the city hasn't done any modifications to it as far as I know so uh, I don't believe the city is responsible for thank the you. erosion thank you councillor Parzal well I'd like to have a comment from staff about that then I have some questions so uh, is that uh, the uh, official view? <laughs> Blair? Uh, uh, thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Yes, the city, this is a natural occurring hazard as a result of a stream called the Dawson Creek running through our city. Um, and there is some erosion, as you can see in the pictures taking place, but uh, this would be a provincial jurisdiction on this. If the city of Dawson Creek was to take on every issue that is caused by a, a water body, I think we would be financially challenged. 
I would suggest, would, is how I would put that. Thank you. Councillor Parzel. Well, we've, we've, let's take, we're building a bridge over the creek, uh, that's because of flooding, right? Um, so we've taken that on, thanks to the federal government. Uh, I mean, being a bit of a devil's advocate here, I'm just trying to look for consistency, right? I mean, so we do mitigate the impact of the creek on our citizens through, when it floods, uh, we try to, and this, this council and previous councils, you looked at the array of infrastructure that is drawn into uh, protecting the community, uh, in the, primarily in the form of bridges and, and so on. And um, um, I'm just, uh, so why do we, why do we do that then? I, I mean, this is a naturally occurring hazard. Um, I accept the comment that Councillor Javaktov made. We, this has not been interfered with by the city at all. So when municipalities um, build bridges, that's because of ensuring crossing, right? But what about diking? Um, let's take the um, let's take the Matsui, the regional district of Matsui, and uh, the extensive diking that goes on there. Is that all paid for by the provincial government, or is the uh, Matsui district uh, initiate that sort of thing? Blair? Through your worship, I would have to check. I'm not sure what Matsui does. I can tell you, for example, Grand Forks has had some flooding. Uh, challenges. There is, I think, tens of millions of dollars that has been injected there from the provincial government okay. based uh, for assistance. Uh, the reason we do bridges, and you touched on it earlier, it's because the city wants those crossings there. Right. Uh, there is no requirement <laughs> that forces the city of Dawson Creek to put those bridges in. Yeah. I think we would hear from the residents had they not been put in. So the mitigation is one part of it, without question. Uh, we have had areas where the city has altered the creek, uh, of which we have a responsibility then to go into. This, uh, un fortunately and unfortunately, you know, diverting a waterway is always creating its own natural challenges, but um, this one will be a challenge, but I do think the responsibility falls with the provincial government and we will continue to work towards a solution with them. I think there's a number of places uh, within our city. I mean, potentially it could go back to 2011 or 2012 when we had the large flood and the dangerous goods route. Um, the mass culvert was changed out there. The flow through coming through town, yeah. uh, I believe, is far more significant, causing some of these challenges. I think they have uh, some responsibility there as well, but we're pursuing a number of options on the creek. Thank you. So. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, are you ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Um, 7.4, we have a letter from Megan Ward, Director of Development of Community Engagement for the 2021 National Women's Under 18 Championships regarding a request for a rice fee waiver for the uh, female hockey development camp that will be held on September 10th to 12th. Can I ask administration, um, they're asking for us to waive the fees of the ice for the camp they're proposing, and do we charge uh, as a youth group our normal fees and then the youth group gets 50% of that. They're asking for a complete waiver. Is Do you, through your worship, yes, they're asking for a complete um, waiver fees, which would be 16 hours. Um, the cost would be $1,671.20 and 20, 20 cents before taxes. And so they're asking for a waiver of that 1671, which would be the fee. Thank you for clarification. Council, Councillor Parslow. Yeah, you know, just um, I'd like staff to stimulate my memory here. We've denied requests for this sort of thing before. Is in, that's in my recollection. Um, for instance, I'm not talking about this particular group, but for the holding of camps. And I can recall one camp got, went moved to Tumbler Ridge. Uh, am, I, am, I, am I getting confused, or is that true that we have denied uh, waiving fees for other camps. Shanti? Through 
through your worship, the camp, the one that you're talking about was the Canucks, and they had asked to waive the summer fees to be the regular fees, and we denied those fees. We have, um, in the past over probably 15 years, there has been times that we have waived fees for senior Canucks games uh, for the, I can't remember this cup, the, and for provincials, we have waived fees. Koi Cup? Koi Cup. Thank you. Councillor Dober. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, is this, what have we done in the past? Like, this is the national team, right? Like, because they've come here in the past and done this. Have we waived fees then, like, on their camps? Through Worship, what has happened sometimes in the past, we partnered with them, and so we would host it. So we would receive grants. And what this director is doing, she's actually trying to find some funding from partnerships for it as well. She's working with Oventiv and working on a grant process with them right now. So sometimes we we would we would as a city take part and be a partner with it. We would host the camp and bring in the 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 money. Right now, what's happening is they're trying to host it on their own through the through our committee. Okay. And, and then waste the fees. Is this at the event center or the, our arenas? This will be at Memorial Arena. It's an event prior to the event. It's going to be for youth, and they'll be bringing in uh, an instructor to do a skills camp, which will be in September. That's so what they're looking are, at doing. like people that live in Dawson Creek are going to be able to participate in this? And regional, anyone. So we've had up to 90 uh, females take part in it before. So we've hosted them many for many years within the city, but right now it's outside of the city. So they're hosting it as the committee. So if council were willing to do this or wanting to do this, it would have to come out of grants, right, for us to fund a request. Blair? Yes, Your yeah. Worship. We have to find the money somewhere. I think this would, sorry, I had one more thing. I, like, I don't know how it all works, but I think something like this would help us stimulate our economy. Like, it would bring a lot of people into town. And I know anytime these events are in town, um, it brings a lot of people in, and, you know, they're supporting all the local businesses, so... Um, I would be in favor somehow of supporting this, whether it's this way or if there's another recommendation. So that we, the funding would have to come, if we're waiving the fees, council, if we're waiving the fees, would have to fund it somewhere, and that would come from grants is the only place we would have it. And I don't know if we have any left in grants uh, at this point. Do, can, could I ask um, Blair if... Uh, Flavia, what, what we have left in our grant budget? Thank you, Worship. And Flavia was just telling me remaining in our unallocated grant fund is two thousand nine hundred dollars. Okay, thank you. Your Worship, can I just say one yep. more thing? Uh, Shante, <laughs> do you, you communicate with this uh, lady often? Shante, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just, I've got. Uh, there you go. There you go. Through your worship. Yeah, I'm the chair of the committee. Oh. And so she is uh, one of the directors. Yeah, it's Megan Ward. Okay. So yeah, what they're you. trying to do, they're trying to bring in, um, they're working with, talk to Barry Raynard as well. We're trying to find uh, someone to bring in that it has a name. Um, I can't remember her first name, but the last name's Nurse. So trying to bring in a, a person through from Canada for hockey. Okay. Have they sure. tried going to local businesses to get like three or four businesses together to support their, their sponsor? So we're going to have to, well, she came here first to see if there was some funding, if, if they were able to waive, and she's also still working on partnerships. So right now we're working to Oventive, and then she is going to go outside. We're also working with the sponsorships as well. We'll go to um, Aaron Powell and Lindsay Lextrom and Megan Pickett. They, they are on the sponsorship for the committee as well. So I'd like to, I'd like to move, we've well, really had some clarification here that I'd really like to go to a motion for council so that we can uh, move it forward. Councillor Parslow, you are next. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if there's a conflict of interest here now. What I've heard, um, you, perhaps clarification. I'm just, just trying to protect you, Shante. You, you, you're the president of this, or chair? chair. chair. Is that a conflict of interest? Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm just raising it just to protect staff. <laughs> She would be presenting, Your Worship, versus voting on this uh, as an outcome, so I don't believe there's an influence okay. on that. Uh, Brenda, I, I would look to that, but that would be my interpretation. Okay. So. so can I ask my yeah, question? Yeah, go ahead. Question, Thank you. Yeah. So I always try, try to understand consistency, right? So um, help me. With Dawson Creek Canuts, much beloved organization in the community, wanted to have a, you said, a summer camp? 
and it was denied. No. So, go ahead, Chante. Funding was denied, or what was denied? Your Worship, what they asked for was to waive. What we have now in our policy is that summer ice is at the cost of the ice, which is approximately $379 an hour. And so Junior Canucks were not able to pay that fee. They requested through Mayor and Council that they go back to the normal fee of the camp at the youth rate, and we denied that. So what they did is they went to Tumbler Ridge and hosted their camp there. Council's policy of summer ice is uh, uh, prior to uh, September 1st, we charge the full rate and we recover the cost of that. And because they weren't willing to pay that uh, or we weren't willing to waive that, they moved the camp to Tumbler Ridge as a result of those fees. They weren't able to afford to host the camp yeah. at that rate. Yeah. So I'm um, looking for a motion. <laughs> Councillor Javekov. I'll make a motion that we provide 50% of the request. $800 out of our grant money. Out of the grant money. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Dober, discussion. Councillor Javekov, go ahead if you'd like to make a comment. Sorry, I'm... Uh, What's going on here? Go ahead. Yeah, I, we've only got uh, less than $3,000 in the grant fund, and um, they're, according to what I heard from Shantae, they are going out for other um, support. So I think uh, supporting it in some way is, um, you know, contributes to the economic development, and there's still an opportunity to, to uh, canvas the community for more support. Thank you for that. Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Worship. Yes, I'm, a, I'm of a mind with Councillor Javetkoff. I think uh, for a cause like this, they should be able to garner um, some, some sponsorship from local organizations without too much trouble. Um, I, I would also p point out, um, this is, I mean, I'm trying to think back to my previous experience in working with hockey tournaments around um, Hockey Canada. And usually, like usually, and I guess this is the second one I've done since I've been on council and not at the event centre, but usually these kind of fees and, and permissions are kind of sorted out at the beginning when the tournament is booked, is it not? Or is this separate from the women's hockey event altogether coming here. Shante. Sorry, through your worship. Uh, what happens is, is the development is separate. So from there, so the development that we would normally do. So how we have done it in the past when the city hosted it, we would have a budget and we would determine how much we have. We used to have in Canada, Brian Levers was, he used to support about $2,500. And then we would bring the fees through, um, the money that we bring in, as well as find funding throughout the community. But Hockey Canada will help with supplies, like for, for prizes and things like that, but not through funding okay. for this hockey development. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? You ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Um, 7.5, we have an email from Bridget Schmidt, uh, Director of Operations and Client Relations at the UBCM Convention Coordinator regarding uh, convention meeting requests uh, with Cabinet Ministers. And um, so I've had Becky on um, Council and uh, we have to have that registration completed. And uh, through the Peaceful Regional District, I've been uh, obviously um, coordinating the input with them of meetings uh, so that we don't have 42 meetings and uh, but we haven't had any response from council who um, indicating they were going to be attending UBCM and so I want to seek your input at this point of those who are attending planning to attend the UBCM convention and uh, input on in any uh, meeting requests you may feel necessary or you'd like to have us arrange. Councillor Earl. Uh, so I'm, I'm is this UBCM going to be um, so like in person, online, or some sort of hybrid, remote, virtual, virtual, virtual? yeah. 
Uh, okay. Um, I will. I will let Becky know. At the top of my head, I can't think of anything, but um, I've, I've got to figure out scheduling. Um, the tr trick for me is it's if I'm taking time off to go somewhere physically, that's one thing. But if I'm booking time off work yeah. to hang out on a Skype call, I, I'm kind of expected to be at work too. Yeah. No. It's and obviously the um, these provincial uh, meetings uh, with the cabinet ministers or the premier, if we had any interest in scheduling mm -hmm. a meeting and so i'll give you a, a list there's about eight minister meetings scheduled at the rd minister of agriculture minister of health minister of energy um a minister of community forest lands natural resources uh caribou health um uh agriculture alr uh issues and i will be participating in each and every one of okay. those uh well, as it relates to and some of them at my request councillor okay. go ahead so off the, i mean off the top of my head i think something that it would be worth having a conversation i'm sure you'll bring it up in your rd but uh with respect to the new hospital um in talking with people a big concern i'm starting to have is is a new hospital's only as useful as our ability ability to staff it um, and we continue to be challenged on that and I think it ties in very well with your worship's uh, initiative or goal of addressing uh, some of the the child care pinch points in our city and how that impacts our health care resourcing so um, I don't know if, if, if you're already going to be doing that through the RD I don't know if it would be redundant for us as a city to book those meetings but it, it certainly a worthwhile conversation to have with the relevant ministers Thank you. And um, I mean, it's technically outside our borders, but getting some um, insight from the Minister of uh, Transportation Infrastructure about the Taylor Bridge and if there's any plan on the horizon to look at replacing that simply because it is a vital artery for economic um, and I guess commercial activity in our region. So that might be worth having that conversation as well. Yeah, no, there's uh, probably a number of them that we will be uh, certainly coordinating with. And, and for us, it was um, more around scheduling meetings that if council are attending UBCM and you see the need and would like us to do that, I'm happy to facilitate that. We just hadn't heard back from anybody that there was an interest in attending UBCM at this point virtually. So I just want to make sure that if there is, that we schedule those now. And or I can report back on uh, those components that we address through um, through the RD. Okay, thank you. So we'll move forward. Um, Here you wish. Yes, Brenda. Uh, just a motion to receive the item. Perfect. Thank you. Receive for information, Councillor uh, Earl. Second, Councillor Kemp. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Meetings are hard uh, without being there uh, in person, and uh, these virtual ones are, are certainly challenging. Uh, 8.1, we have report number 21101 from the Parks and Facilities Manager regarding our uh, Ovinta ice plant upgrades required to meet the pro new, these provincial regulations on... Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not the free on the ammonia so C councillor uh Jibekoff, go ahead i'll move that report number 21-101 from the facilities manager reoventive ice plant upgrades to meet provincial regulations be received further that council reallocate sixty four thousand nine hundred and thirty five dollars plus tax from the exterior PA system capital project to cover the Ovinta ice plant upgrades and direct staff to complete the work prior to October. I can't see the date, but 2021. October 15. Yeah. Thank you. Second, Councillor Parslow. Discussion? Councillor Javekov, did you have a comment you wanted to make on it? Um, well, you know, the work has obviously got to be done, and uh, I think it takes priority over a PA system for the outside, which I don't know what that was about, but uh, anyways, it's provincial regulation. It's got to be done. So. For sure. Thank you. Councillor uh, Parslow, sorry. 
Yes, uh, same reason, safety. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried, thank you. Report uh, 8.2, report number 21102 from the recreation manager regarding 2021 summer ice requests. Uh, Councillor Parslow, did you want to speak to it? Your light's on, and I don't know sorry. if you closed it off. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm looking for direction from council here. Councillor uh, Javeka, or sorry, Councillor uh, Dober. Sorry, when there's a recommendation and there's three options in there and you're reading it out, do you just choose one that you feel? Yep. Okay. I'll make a motion that report number 21-102 from the Recreation Manager. Reason 2021 summer ice request be received further that council approve option B. Cost based on 126 hours times 392.72 summer ice rate uh, divide, well, times 50% reduction, uh, which would equal $24,741.36 plus applicable taxes. Thank you, Councillor. Second? For a second time, do I have a seconder? Councillor Earl, discussion? Councillor Pars uh, Councillor Dober, go ahead. Um, well, I think a couple things. Uh, I mean, I made the motion because I wanted to discuss it, but um, I, I understand. Is the, the cost higher in the summer because we're putting the ice in earlier? Because, you know, I, I go back to the last comment about us denying the Junior Canucks and without knowing the details it doesn't make sense to me because we're now shipping them to a different economy where they're in, you know in, you know benefiting their economy um when there's probably still a cost to us to keep it empty now. so i'm just kind of curious is this Do you because we're putting that? ice in early is that why the cost is higher blair yes there's a, a policy of mayor and council uh that the summer ice prior to september 1 as was stated would be at the full cost recovery. I believe this year it's three hundred ninety-two dollars. It's the full cost recovery, so that is all encompassing. What it costs—that's the number of hours through the year, what the arena cost, and what the subsidized um, amount is. Because arenas and pools, for example, I think it's fair to say, don't make monies for any municipality. They're a service that we deliver to the community. So, what they've we have done collectively as a body, being mayor and council, it's <laughs> a policy that said prior to the date um, being September 1 or September 3rd, I believe, if I remember correctly, um, that you would pay full ice rental, which is the $390 in that range. As soon as the uh, regular season starts, we'll call it September 3rd, it's the Friday, um, they would go to, you could get youth rates and the other rates become applicable. But before that, it is the full cost. So, for example, last year, the Junior Canucks applied uh, to have a summer uh, hockey school. I'll call it summer. It's very late, late August. Um, at which time, council said no, they would pay the full rate. They then had to relocate due to financial. I'll, I'll let them speak to that, but the financial side of it and it was relocated to Tumbler Ridge, that hockey camp. So that is the reason for the two. If you ran all year long at $392, and correct me, Shantae, if I'm wrong, we would be at a break-even point. Facilities don't operate that way, or you probably wouldn't have minor hockey. You wouldn't have um, people having rec league and so on. Just one more question to add to that. So... <coughs> $392 is if the ice is being used. What's our cost if it's empty? We've still got staff in there. We're still... 
So what's the, the difference? Obviously, they got to clean the ice every hour. And yeah, so <laughs> what we had said, there was a rate of 400 to $450 a day what with utility so when when right now when we're dry season we just would use our electricity like at present time would be our electricity and any water that we have which would be limited i don't have those costs right here with me but it'd be limited with what the costs are because we don't have anything once we put the energy on the plant uh the freon plant takes more electricity more energy so we take up that more energy so as per a fees and charges the cost throughout the whole year would be 379 dollars i need to one more thing, sorry, I forgot to say to yeah. your worship. Um, one of the reasons why, too, is the fee used to be a different rate for summer ice, but it was a direction by council that we go back to the cost of what the ice is for summer ice. It was a directive that council had given us. So if we don't approve this, we don't put ice in there until September 3rd, and then that's when the fees? Correct. So no. there'll be no, like, camp system. That's correct. And what happens is, is one of the reasons why we've asked to wait, waive the fees is because it's been a really awkward season, bizarre season. They haven't had a season. So when th they have requested it, so we had put in there to request to waive the fees so that they could try to have back to a normal camp, be able to host a camp for the, for the sport users um, prior to the season and keep them in Dawson Creek. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Shante. Councillor uh, Earl. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, just a couple questions to staff. So this is asking for the two weeks prior to the September 3rd ice be put in early. So this $392.72 per hour, is that based on a 24-hour day or is that based on a 12 hours of available ice time day or what's that look like? Shante, go ahead. Through Your Worship. Um, that base is based, we open from 5.30 in the morning till 1.30 at night. So that would okay. be what our base would be. And again, that's through our fees and charges rate. And we're updating that right now. Um, it will be ready in the next few months. So but that, that was, that's, that's what the fee is. 19 hours a day? Uh, 20. So that would be 5.30 to 1.30 would be 20 hours. And available ice would be from 6 to approximately 12.30 at night. Okay. So we're looking at a cost of $7,800 a day to open that facility for two weeks. And Aaron has the fees in there with what it would cost in the option. So if we don't waive the fees, the cost would be $49,000. Yes, yeah. but, um, okay. Um, Thank you. You're looking for a cost differential. Yeah, I'm looking for, cause you know, the ice isn't as we've, we've heard, the ice isn't booked up throughout all the available time. So there's, there's some dead time where we're still that $392 an hour is still accumulating to the city, the taxpayers, or still going to the taxpayers. So, Aaron? Um, through your worship, we are actually, it looks like you're green. Green? green? Yep. Oh, I don't touch it then. Sorry. <laughs> through your worship, we are actually still looking for other people to take up the other times of ICE so that it will be available. We have a few um, individuals interested. However, they will not take it if it is summer ICE cost, just because, again, it is too high for them. And um, right now, even just to make the 126 hours, I, uh, figure skating has agreed to even take some ice at dead ice so they are taking ice already that they don't need because they are really wanting this ice time thank you councillor jebekoff so <clears throat> we've got twenty one hundred dollars left in our grant fund uh where would this money come from would it be coming from our paving program or uh, one of the other funds your worship this fund would come from a contingency or surplus uh, fund it would have to um, that would be it versus reallocating from another source that's already budgeted so that would affect our uh, initiative that seems like everybody's adopted this initiative to get to 30 percent uh, operational costs over 10 years we have uh, within the budget contingencies built in uh, on a, for a number of factors for different reasons. Um, I don't believe this request, uh, based on where council goes in the future, would alter the 70-30 at this point with this amount of money. Thank you. Councillor Parslow. Well, Councillor Javatkov has uh, 
basically raised this 30%. What, what is he referring to? Is, is he referring to the overall reduction in our budget? What is that? I interpreted the question based on the strategic goal of 70-30. Oh, as it relates to the... revenue, if I'm correct. For the piece of cord running? Yes. Okay. Well, I was um, listening to these figures, you know, and I, I started to think, I guess, in the same direction, you know. Um, do you mean uh, staff has been working hard, uh, for instance, uh, negotiating new user agreements with different organizations? Uh, many have had significant reductions in, the, in their funding. And I was just wanting staff to put this, this topic in context of the overall direction that we've been taking. Is this increasing our expenditures or helping us to reduce our expenditures, this, this business about summarize? Well, through you, Your Worship, this would increase our costs. Uh, obviously, if you're going to, the motion right now is to waive it by 50%. So uh, you would be cutting the full ice time user fee by half. Mm -hmm. uh, similar to what you did in the previous motion for the U18s. That motion was passed. So uh, there is a cost to it without question. Uh, it comes with that. But again, that is a, definitely a direction the council will vote on and we will execute the wishes of Mayor and Council. Thank you. Councillor Dover. One last thing. Sorry. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just like think of the whole picture of this and, you know, in business and success in the future, it's about creating, it's not about looking at dollars today. It's about how do we gain some momentum in the future. And we're sending camps to Fort St. John, Grand Prairie, other communities, which is, you know, stimulating their economy. Like, it, that makes no sense to me. Like, I get the savings today, but it's about, like, let's create, you know, if there's a camp that's here every summer, people will get used to it and they'll come back every year and we'll make more money long term. Like, instead of the, you know, the short term thinking about let's just grind it today, I think it do doesn't make sense to me, not the way I think in life or business. So, um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you, Councillor. Further discussion? Councillor Javekov, one more time. Or, sorry, I've got who's up next? Those lights on. Councillor Dober? Councillor Javeka. Yeah, so <clears throat> I won't support the motion. I, you know, you have to consider this isn't the city municipality just isn't about sports and hockey. We've got taxpayers that are in dire straits because we're charging an extra two dollars for a hard copy of an invoice. Um, there are lots of issues that that uh, that come up and and these are all this money is is all money that comes from our taxpayers i've got feedback that our taxes are too high um so you know there are other ways to support sports this is a a, a community city uh, we have lots of examples of strong community support to support these kind of things. Um, if we had money allocated for a grant that would cover this request, I would be more uh, in favor of it. But uh, we've already used up most of our grant money. We've only got $2,100 left. So to take money from other pro programs, and I I understand there's contingencies and there's surpluses and there's uh, money that's set aside for future work, uh, but this to me isn't a priority. There are other ways to handle it in the community. Like, yeah, granted, you know, it's just tax money. We could go ahead and spend it, uh, but I don't agree with that. I, you know, we've got a budget. We've set up a plan. We agreed to uh, uh, an amount for grants. We've got a, an initiative that to me is, is sacred, that we're trying to reduce our PRA funding, or, or our, our PRA allocation uh, for operations. This is a big project. I mean, we've talked about it lots of times. And it's, to me, it's, uh, 
you don't you don't accomplish that by chiseling money out of the system for these kind of projects. So, anyways, I'm not in favor of it, and uh, I think that uh, you know this could be supported by the community, and the example of sending that uh, camp to Tumblr last year. Um, you know, it's all in the region, and I don't think that hurts us. Thank you. So, uh, one last, and I'm going to speak. I, I'm in complete uh, support of this. Um, we talk about initiatives that build our community, and we talk about health care as one example. Uh, we can attract sometimes doctors into our community because of some of the amenities that we don't have or that we're not offering. And to me, uh, we've been through a year and a bit of a tough time of a pandemic that nobody would have... Uh, experienced or uh, felt we would ever experience and so to me this is a way for us to get um, our children uh, back in and families back in to enjoying those amenities that they come to a community and expect that we will provide those services too. That's why we have arenas. That's why our residents voted in a referendum to build an event center and that's why we have a pool and that's why we have these things to operate them and provide those amenities. And then we got hotels being built because we have a community that uh, builds upon those things of people coming to our community. And those guys pay us 150 or 200 grand a year in taxes and, and that's what helps build our community. And so I'm in complete support of it. I think it's a, a great way for us to get our community back uh, into operation and help us uh, have a reputation of a community that offers a great quality of life and attract those professionals we need. So I'm all in favor of it. And I am calling in the question on it. And so all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Oh no, we're a tie, 3-3. Three, three. Sorry. Uh, so the motion uh, will fail. And so do I have uh, anybody want to make a, another motion in regards to this item? So thank you, we'll move on. 8.3, report number 21-100 from the General Manager of Development Services regarding Recy Recycle BC Agreement, 8.3. Councillor Parslow, go ahead. I'd like to move the report 21-100 from the General Manager of Development Services the Recycle BC agreements be received further the council authorized staff to enter into both the master service agreement and the statement of work agreement effective August the 3rd, 2021 with the program onboarding of February 2022. Further, the initial term continue until December the 31st, 2023 with the option to extend up to two further periods of one year. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councilor Javekov. Discussion? If I may. Councillor Parzo, go ahead. Um, first, I, I, I've got several questions or maybe statements. <laughs> One's a question. Um, I'm quite comfortable with the general intent of this. Uh, what, what is meant, though, just making sure I'm, I'm supporting something that I have absolute <laughs> clarity on, with a program onboarding date of February? Now, can you explain that part? What is that language getting at? Kevin? Sorry, go ahead. I'm just, I'm so. There you go, Kevin. Yeah, so through your worship, so in discussions with Recycle BC, um, you know, both parties agreed that there's going to be some work to do leading up to actually starting the program. As you've seen in there, Recycle BC has requirements that we need to meet with contamination and whatnot. So, uh, the educational side, we need to get people up to speed. Yeah. So the onboarding, the actual commencement of when Recycle BC will start to fund and also then, you know, the carrot and the stick of also requiring us to try and meet those requirements, we decided it would be best if it was into the new year and we didn't want to do it January 1, so we decided early February. Yeah, perfect sense to me. Thank you. I have a... Now, where... I, I've just read something that got my interest in, and I had sent it to Councillor Shaley uh, for her interest here. And what I'm getting at is that the provincial government uh, reports that the average per person solid waste going to landfills in the province of British Columbia is 506 kilograms a person. And they're setting a target that that be reduced to 350 kilograms per person. And 
there, the landfills are getting, getting filled, and, and that is a problem throughout the province. And they're saying that really we need to really address trying to reduce the amount of solid waste per person. And we need to be emphasizing reduce, reuse, and repair. And we need to deal with single-use packaging um, and so on. So am I correct that this will all reflect in this um, education and this onboarding that will be part of this program that we are really trying to not just recycle, but actually reduce the amount of material. Kevin? So, Your Worship, um, absolutely. I mean, that's the intent. Um, there's a couple. Obviously, the city, um, th the whole program is to reduce the impact on solid waste. And through the solid waste plan at the regional district and so on regionally, we, we we're a member of that and we've we've signed up and, and committed to doing that. That's one thing. The other is the Recycle BC component, which we're going to partner with, who they were formed by the producers of the the materials that they have a responsibility and a stewardship to dispose of these materials properly. So through that and through that funding um, is, is to bring that uh, and to reduce that material going into the waste stream. So as part of that, it's in their best interest, of course, to, to have the educational materials. And that's um, certainly what we look forward to is, is this partnership. They've done this in a number of communities. They've, they've had challenges in a number of areas. And, um, you know, they're up for, up for the challenge. And also with the, the ability to provide us the funding that gives us that opportunity to, to approach it in a, you know, in a more strategic manner. Yep, go ahead. So is it within the potential landscape in the future here that we as a council will be addressing the question of single-use plastics? So I'm, I'm going to jump in because <clears throat> the solid waste management plan is uh, part of the regional district that we all are a part of. And so we only provide the curbside collection to residents and then the post-collection costs and the post-collection process is all handled by and through the Peace River Regional District. That whole piece about accessibility of markets and the China sword and all of those things that now have eliminated, in some cases, markets, as well as increased costs of um, the post-collection uh, disposal of recycled materials is certainly one that's um, ongoing and they're looking at every option of adding more um, perhaps uh, organics, uh, removing that from the waste stream um, and certainly the whole issue of, dis of what it does. For us in the rural area, land costs are so much cheaper that it's costing us more than if we simply just landfilled it but we're trying to be stewards and, and adhere to the legislation under the solid waste management plans that we file on behalf of and through the Ministry of Environment. But it is uh, accessibility of markets, contamination, sing uh, the plastic, single-use plastics, all of those things add to the overall cost that we're all paying for it. And if we just simply landfill it, it would be much, much cheaper to our residents, but you're not living up to the solid waste management plan. So is it feasible that the re regional district will be asking municipalities to uh, assist with this issue by passing legislation, if it's, that's the right word, concerning single-use plastic? We're, we're all part of that process. All the municipalities are part of that input into the solid waste management plan, and we are just working on the finalization of filing our new five-year solid waste management plan with respect to that. And waste energy is another one that they're really looking at as well because, say, maybe there's a way for us to produce energy and burn it all. Uh, to produce energy from that and you you dispose of this plastics. They're looking at their different components of producing um, plastic uh, posts, fence posts. There's a guy in Saskatchewan that's developed that process. So they're looking at all kinds of options to try to reduce costs and deal with them effectively. But we as municipalities are part of that process, absolutely. Councillor um, 
Did you back off? So, <laughs> this issue, like we've been into this recycling here for a year or two, and uh, we've tried educating, and it's not working, obviously, very effectively. And to get down to 3%, um, I don't know if $162,000 is going to get us there unless we get aggressive on enforcement. And um, I know that uh, we talked about enforcement, but I haven't heard anybody that's got a ticket, but yet we're still getting contaminated uh, bins. Um, but I don't remember if we've talked about escalating enforcement. So the initial ticket is $150. What's the second one? Is it 300 or... But I guess my point is, or, or my suggestion is that we, there's a lot of emphasis in this report here on enforcement. I would like to see more emphasis or on uh, education. I'd like to see more emphasis on enforcement. Because um, that $162,000 in education can be burnt up and we've still got a problem. 3% is, is pretty... Um, Pretty low percentage. Kevin? Yes, so through your worship, um, I concur that 3% is an aggressive target, and, and Recycle BC has, has acknowledged that. And, and we know it's going to take some time to, to get there, and the provincial average is 6% with their uh, members within the Recycle BC program. So we've got a ways to go, there's no doubt about that. Um, over the last while since we've been doing the audits, we have issued some tickets. Surprisingly, uh, now that everybody knows we're doing audits, we haven't run into uh, the same extent of what we were seeing before. So we haven't seen the real dangerous, egregious stuff that we saw earlier. We still see issues, but not to the same extent. But we have issued some tickets. Um, I know I was down in the office uh, talking to Bylaw the other day last week and, and just on one day I think we issued four four tickets. Um, the protocol is is typically the first time if it's just let's just say it's a bunch of soft plastics that's an educational opportunity. If it's food waste uh, we're going to give them a ticket. Uh, if we have repeat uh, offenders basically the the progression is education ticket removal of bin on the third time if we remove your bin you're still going to pay for the program you're just not going to have access to the program so that's the progression we're at right now thank you councillor earl uh, thank you worship um yeah i mean my my i'm i guess at this point in favor of pulling out all the stops to get some success with this it's been pretty frustrating so far my obvious concern is that uh, January 1st, 2024, uh, once this program ends, we shoot back up to, you know, we've seen as we've, we've uh, done active enforcement, people seem to uh, comply. But the second we take our foot off the gas, um, those numbers shoot back up. And I guess I hope, I guess over time, our, we're hoping that people just get used to it or trained to do it so that when those numbers go back up, it's not to the same extent. But yeah, at this point, it does feel as I, I don't feel at this point as though it's a lack of education for the vast majority of people. I think people are just malicious or being ignorant about it. And, and I don't know how we, um, you know, do, do we keep going back asking grown-ups not to throw used cat litter in the recycling bin how many times so I, I agree we we have to inevitably pull the bin um it's just um yeah it's it's frustrating so thank you to staff and i'll support this but thank you uh so with that i'll call the question all those in favor opposed it's carried thank you and so with that we'll take a uh, five minute recess and uh, we'll be back at 10.45, seven minutes. So I was back, uh, call ourselves back to order. The other group uses highways is repairing the roads. I see they've done a lot of work, yeah. And I'm too glad he's busting that. So we're on to item 8.4, report number 21097, which is our privacy policy update. 
Councillor Parslow. I move the report 21-097 from the Corporate Officer of Privacy Policy be received. Further, the privacy policy attached to this report be approved pending the completion of a successful 30-day review period. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Dober. Discussion? Comments, Council? Brenda, anything? No? Yes, Your Worship. It's, this is just a policy to formalize how the city collects their information. Uh, we do have a contract with ICBC that uh, we uh, get information through licensing to uh, for our parking tickets and just uh, we need to ensure that we um, take care in the personal information that we collect and how we use it and dispose of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I had mentioned to Brenda, uh, part of this, I think my uh, history and my old uh, days with ICBC under contract, they supply those vehicle registration uh, services to IC, or to the government uh, through motor vehicle. And so I know that there would be some type protocols that they would have to have in regards to releasing any information. So that just makes sense to me. Thank you, Brenda. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. 8.5, we have report number 21098 from the Corporate Officer regarding our 2020 annual report. Councillor Dober. I'll make a motion that report number 21-098 from the Corporate Officer uh, reason 2020 annual report be received further that the Dawson Creek annual report for 2020 be approved as presented. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor uh, Kemp, discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Uh, item 8.6, report number 21099 from the corporate officer regarding the Sudeten Hall heritage designation. Councillor Javekov. Move that report number 21-099 from the corporate officer re Sudeten Hall heritage dedication be received further that council's direction to staff on February 22nd, 2016 to designate Sudeten Hall as a municipal heritage building be rescinded and further that staff be authorized to transfer ownership of Sudeten Hall to the Mile Zero Park Society dependent on approval for the city to have rent-free use of the facility up to three times per year. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Kemp, discussion? Your Comments? Worship. Staff? Blair? Your Worship, on this, if I could. So the recommendation contains approval for the city to uh, transfer ownership. That would be we would enter discussions with the Mile Zero, Mile Zero Park Society uh, and pending their acceptance. Uh, we've had some earlier discussions with the previous president and board. There was some interest, but uh, I don't want to be presumptive to the fact that it would automatically transfer. I think this would be, uh, it's a willing giver, willing taker scenario, so the society would have to uh, accept that as well. So, Thank right. you. Thank you. Councillor Parcel? Yeah, I was basically wanting to... Uh, make sure everybody knew that uh, our staffs had excellent communication with this society about this. And the, and the wording might <laughs> have said, thought, you know, people might have thought, but here, you've got it whether you want it or not, right? Uh, no, it's not. No, in fact, I talked to Alex Reshny uh, about this just before council meeting, and it's it. So it's a much appreciated, and it will be given good consideration by the, by the executive. Thank you. Further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, item 9 is bylaws. We have nothing. Uh, item 10, Mayor's Business. So just a few qu quick items. We had the Filipino flag uh, raising and declaring the Filipino Heritage Month uh, within the community. I really appreciated the opportunity. And um, we got um, always a very strong turnout from uh, Kalipi South Peace, the organization representing the Filipino community here in Dawson Creek and uh, certainly family community uh, work is so important to these residents and we always appreciate uh, their commitment to our community. I, present, I attended the Northern Medical Programs Trust, AGM. Uh, this Northern Medical Programs Trust is a trust that was set up 
years ago uh, in partnership with the University of Northern BC as part of um, the um, Northern community supporting the building of the Northern Medical Program. Sorry, you guys are looking at me. I'm okay? All good? Okay. And uh, it was all about this Northern Medical Program uh, when it was established at U uh, UNBC and the um, building of um, that program. And so all of us, has, or the majority of communities in Northern BC um, participated and put the funding in to build the trust. And now we have this program where it's, it's ongoing, where programs are de built and delivered, part of the resident programs, part of a traveling roadshow, et cetera, that are funded through the trust, administered by the University of Northern BC and we have their annual AGM. Uh, it was host held about uh, a week ago. Um, we've completed our housing needs uh, uh, assessment uh, and we've received our report. The PRRD hosted a workshop last week. I participated in last Wednesday night, I think, and just to give feedback in terms of that uh, process that's undergoing now in the completion of it by Urban Matters within the Peace River Regional District and I just wanted to participate to ensure that we understand those components of housing needs uh, not only for our community but the region. Uh, last week the Fort St. John Chamber of Commerce hosted a two-day uh, conference called Creating Energy and I sat on a panel with uh, Northern Mayors, uh, Mayor Ackerman, Mayor Bertrand, Mayor uh, Foster from Fort Nelson, Northern Rockies, and uh, Mayor Coutre from Chetwin, and we just talked about the impact of uh, uh, the energy sector in our communities and region. Last Saturday, a week ago Saturday, was the Nowakan Bergeron Youth and Cultural Center official opening. We heard the ladies, uh, Teresa at our delegation, speak a bit about that, and so the um, our official opening was last Saturday, a week ago Saturday, and uh, so I had the opportunity to attend on behalf of Council, and it was very, very well done. And Boy, if people haven't been through this new facility that's providing um, uh, youth and cultural activities and awareness in our community that Jana and that team have done, it's very, very impressive and really uh, well done, and my compliments and congratulations to them. Any comments or questions from Council on any of that? 10.2, uh, the unsightly property that uh, we had at 9412 8th Street. Blair, did you want to, do we need to do anything? Or? Your Worship, the delegation we have not heard from yet uh, at this point in the day. So there is a letter. They were deemed unsightly. They had until July 8th to clean it up. I believe some work is ongoing at the site right now and may very well meet uh, the requirements, but as of July 8th that will be dealt with if it hasn't been uh, completed and duly cleaned up. Thank you. And the Caribou Recovery Program, I don't think there was any request or anything in there that we have to deal with or um, uh, forward on. So, Councillor Javeka. I just had a question on the unsightly properties. Has the city done work on that property before? Through your worship, yes, the city has, uh, this is a, a well-known property to the city. So uh, does that, the, does the cost that we incur go on to the tax bill? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, yeah, it does. I mean, traditionally what happens is we will go up, we will spend uh, whatever it is, a thousand, two thousand uh, dollars to clean up the site. Uh, mm -hmm. The bill is then there to pay it. Uh, most times in this case it has not been paid and it reverts to their tax bill. So. Thank you. Any further comments, questions? Thank you for that, Blair. Uh, CAO report? Um, Your Worship, we've covered everything other than really just to encourage people to be careful in the heat. It's interesting, you know, usually we're talking about 35 or 45 below and we're worried. Now we're talking 35 or 40 degrees uh, above. It's somewhat unusual for us, but um, I think we will all get through it. I know that uh, the Nowakan Friendship Centre is working. There is uh, an issue for people that don't have a place to go to cool down. Nowakan has agreed to open the Nowakan Friendship Centre uh, for people. We have also got water uh, with our staff out there, so when they see people, uh, making sure you're hydrated in these uh, high temperatures is key. 
So the community is working together to make sure those that are you know most in need are looked after. So thank you to the Nowakan and to Jana. I think that is a huge step and uh, really speaks to our community. The other one I'll just say is, you know, I ask for people's patience with the amount of road work that is just beginning and going to go on throughout the summer. There are going to be some challenges for traffic. Uh, but again, I think uh, I probably speak for the majority. I would rather put up with the challenges of the road work being done than put up with the challenges of uh, the roads not being repaired. So that's it, Your Worship, for today. Thank you, Blair. Um, diary? Nothing to report on? Nothing new, Your Worship. Uh, consent calendar, if I can have a motion for proof of consent. Councillor Dober, second Councillor Earl. Uh, all those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Is there anything anybody would like to lift uh, from the consent? Strategic priorities? Nothing new. Media? So we'll move to Committee of the Whole, and uh, so perhaps if we can... Um, and I'm not sure where if Damon is here yet or Marcel, but maybe if we can begin with our staff and then we can let them know that we are going to be available for them. And uh, so we'll vary the committee of the whole reports and move to our uh, general manager of community services, item 16.4. Welcome. Good. Sorry. Is Damon here? Awesome. Okay, well, we'll get Shantae done, and then Damon can come in, and we'll move forward with him. No problem. Thank you. So go ahead, Shantae. Three Floor is yours. We just wanted to do a few updates um, because the next cow report will be in October. So one of the things is, is that we still are trying to find staffing for the aquatic center. We are work working with the HR department um, to determine how we can bring in staff. There's two full-time positions and two part-time positions. They're posted internal first, and then we will, if there's anyone that will post if there's, we may have one person that may apply and then we'll go external, but lifeguards is um, a challenge all the way across the province, all across the nation to try to bring lifeguards in. So we're trying to find some creative ways to bring those lifeguards to our pool as we still only have 11. The other thing that we wanted to bring up um, is that um, we're waiting for the formula. Once we get to stage th uh, step three and step four, we're waiting for the formula, what the formula will be for the change rooms. So right now we can have eight in the family, six in the female and four in the men. And so once those formulas come, we can determine how we can move forward with, with the pool, with aquatic center. Um, but if we aren't able to increase the people in the change room at a time, it's going to be hard to increase up to 300 people at a time at the pool. The other thing that we wanted to bring up too is that when we do reopen um, at this time with the amount of staff that we have, we will still continue with a five day operation. As soon as we can change that with the number of staff we have, we will do a slow restart to go back. We don't just want to go from 50 patrons right to 300 people. So we're <coughs> going to go and do the tra training of the staff like we did when we first opened the pool and when we when we as well open the pool in the fall. So it's just a slow, slow, a little slower process. Um, the idea when we get to a seven day operation, we will be changing the schedule a little bit differently. As I stated in there, we will be um, opening at 3.30 to 5.30, which will be times for swim lessons, directly for swim lessons, as well as rentals for SEAL Swim Club. We normally were open at three o'clock on, but these times will be set for swim lessons as well as the rentals, and then we will open again until 9 o'clock. On the weekends, we're looking at extending to be opening at 12 o'clock instead of 1 o'clock on Saturday and Sundays, which has been really great right now opening up. We had great feedback. We'll also reincorporate the family swim on Saturday mornings um, as soon as we can. Um, that family swim time has been great for people, so we will do that in the morning as well. And then on Saturday evenings, what we'll look at doing is not every Saturday evening, but we'll periodically have events that will be ho hosted with partnerships. Um, could be a movie night, it could be just a Hawaiian night, whatever it would be. It be, could be a youth night, it could be a family night, however we end up changing it. So those are some of the changes that will happen when we move there. And we just wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of that before we started shifting into those changes. Uh, the last thing that we wanted to bring up too is that um, with the multi-use park with the tennis courts, um, we have seen that there's some continued sloughing on the creek. So we are looking at possibly relocating. If we receive the grant, we're possibly looking at relocating that tennis court from where it currently is further down um, 
it would be east into the into the field. That's one of the locations that we're looking at right at present time, but nothing is set. Are there any questions? Thank you, Shante. Questions? Councillor Jarecko? <clears throat> um, under your operational strategies on number two there, you've got uh, Rotary Lake remediation and new splash park development plans. Uh, is that a result of the consultation process that's been going on? Is that determined that there's a new splash park? To your worship, this was the documentation that was used from when um, we had it. So right now we're just doing the uh, Rotary Lake redemption. So there's not a plan set forth for that. They've just completed the the two stages of meeting the groups together and then individually they'll be coming up with three options, urban systems will, and we'll be looking at that. So nothing has been set there. <clears throat> So what does this splash park refer to then? Through your worship, um, prior to, these were the these were the strategies that were prior to when I was here, so I'll have to go back and review them because... Um, I may be able to help. So in the discussions, the original concept was to find out what the Rotary Park was going to look like post the lake being closed. Um, there has been talk by mayor and council about a water park in the community. So that discussion was also being had with this group. Would it look like a spot for a water park to be put into the old Rotary Lake site, for example? I believe that's what this is trying to capture as a result of discussions of mayor and council and the discussions ongoing about the Rotary Lake site. So this is just a concept, it's not oh, a... very actor. much. You're, you're not working on developing the plans. You haven't got engineers involved and hydrologists and... Council, uh, council wouldn't be the ones that would appoint those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor uh, Parslow? Uh, Shante, multi-use outdoor facility project. Now that's the... The hope for revamping of tennis courts, a pickleball and stuff like that. Correct. That's the right. That's the right project. Good. And I like the I like the heading of it. I'll start to be familiar with that. But that the so the creek banks. It's amazing to me that the creek banks uh, are so they're so close to this. I I I'm a little amazed at. Uh, the sloughing of the creek. How far? What's the distance between the creek and this intended facility? Is it is it a much expanded facility than we currently have? Must be. Do you want me to go? go ahead. Okay, through your worship. Um, so where the creek has started to slough. So when we move in the current plan for the multi-use group, we continue. It would it would touch the end of the um, walking track on the west side and then in the parking lot where if you're in the parking lot at the end where the tennis where the baseball diamond yep, is yep. that's where the sloughing has started it's it's probably about a 20 foot span and it's sloughed there we have a actually a red fence there right now the the fence there so it started to slough a little Ooh. bit different kevin might be able to or blair might be able to answer a little bit more on that but that's currently where it is so we're re looking at should we be putting it there because right now that tennis court has been there for 50 years yeah. so we want this next group to be there for 50 years and it's, if it's starting to slough is that the best place for it so we're trying to figure out the best way to spend our the finances yeah thank you mm. further questions councillor dober uh, thank you worship uh thanks shantay for the report i just had one uh, when you were talking about as the stages of covid get lifted and we're going to get back to normal like um is there a like, I get that you got to do it in steps once it gets there, but is there going to be a priority to get it moving quicker just to get the revenue stream back in for the city and also give the citizens of Dawson um, more use to the facilities? Through your worship, as soon as we, we ha the staffing is going to be key. Restart program, what, what we have, like, depending on how many people we can get back into the pool at the one time, that's, num that's one. But number, the biggest thing is our staffing. We have 11 staff. We are not able to maintain a seven-day operation. We have to be careful how we bring those staff in there. So we need to take those two. There's a lifeguard three position. There's a lifeguard two position at 40 hours. And there's 
two lifeguard, two positions at 25 hours. So we need to have the staff there to get back to where we need to be. We've lost over the last two years, we've lost people because they moved, went away to school. Um, and so we have to really figure out how we're going to get staff there. We've tried the LAP program, which was a free program for bringing lifeguard apprentices in. And we've had minimal staff. We even paid them to come become a lifeguard. So those three programs have not worked. We're also working with the school district to figure out how we can get lifeguarding in there like Fort St. John and Fort Nelson have that like so in grade 10 11 and 12 you could take it as an elective so well, then you could have the lifeguard so we're trying that we're working also with um Aubert as well as Naukin and Aubert is looking at possibly playing paying for people that want to become a lifeguard so if you want to take your bronze medallion bronze cross and want to become a lifeguard they'll pay for them instead of us offering it for free they'll find some funding through the Aubert society as well so we're trying to look some creative ways to get the lifeguards. The lifeguard is the key part to getting us back to going. The staff have been absolutely amazing. Yeah. They are. We have three 15-hour staff. They work sometimes more than 15 hours. We How we make them work in the casual staff as well. We're probably going to lose a couple casual staffs in um, the summer too because they might be relocating as well. So it's a very slow process. We're trying to get the instructing going as well. So hopefully that's a little long-winded, but Thank that's you. where we're at. That, that We have a priority. We want to get back to where we couldn't get open as long, many hours as we can to get people back into that pool. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments? Further questions? Thank you. Thank you, Shante. And so now we'll move back to um, our 16-1 uh, and we'll ask Damon if he's here and he can join us. Good morning, Damon. Welcome. Good morning, Your Worship. Good morning, Thanks Council. for joining us. Thank you. Am I all turned on here? Or? Yeah, you're Perfect. good to go. Thank you. Thank you for doing that for me. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. I am here to talk to you about the policing report for the month of May. Uh, so I'll get right into the resources for May. Uh, no movement in or out of the detachment for the month of May. We're presently operating fully staffed with no surplus positions. Um, succession planning is underway for multiple members. I have multiple members right now coming and going. Uh, at least five members I've identified, uh, that I've identified that will be moving out in the next one to two months. I've also got five members incoming uh, uh, with various date ranges. So there may be some overlaps. There also may be some brief um, um, uh, periods of time in which uh, the officer leaves and, I, and, the, and the next one's incoming. So I'm working through that right now, but uh, lots of movement that's coming up here right away. We're still carrying seven soft vacancies. That includes two members on maternity or paternity leave and five off duty, sick or injured. One of those uh, will be coming back in September for sure. And we're, the others are being supported to return to work when they are able. Moving to crime trend reporting. Uh, so the crime trend reporting is for the period of January 1st to May 31st this year. Uh, to date, we've taken 3,550 calls for service. That's an increase of about 14% from last year. About 81% of those calls were within the city of Dawson Creek. The remaining 19% were within the rural surrounding area. So comparative to last time or last year for the same time period, that works out to about an increase of 18% of calls within the city and an increase of 1% in the rural area. Uh, our property crime uh, calls are continuing to decrease. So what we've been seeing mostly throughout the year is property crimes continuing to drop, theft of vehicle, break and enters. Uh, we're seeing decreases across those groups. Uh, we're seeing some, again, some slight increases in our person's crimes. So assaults, sex assaults, as well as mental health calls. One thing I'll point out is last month I made an error when I reported uh, a decrease in assaults. I reported a 8% decrease in assault. It actually should have been an 8% increase. So I must have misread that or perhaps I was just hoping for it. But uh, I made an error when I reported it to you last month. So uh, we did have last month an 8% increase in assaults. Now uh, to date we're at about 23% increase from last year. Uh, COVID related calls we fielded so far this year about 106 calls for service. Our policing priorities, we have five priorities identified for the year. The first one being impaired driving. May 22nd was National Impaired Driving Day, so we had multiple roadblocks set up throughout the city with over 100 vehicles stopped and checked, and of course we found no impaired drivers during that time. Uh, for the month of May, however, we did intercept eight impaired drivers. 
Our second policing priority is drugs or substance abuse. Uh, the detachment participated in a community opiate action team meeting in May, and our officers are now carrying naloxone kits for our proactive handout to the clients that we're dealing with every day. So if you recall last month, I reported to you that we were working on that. Our officers are now carrying the naloxone and handing it out to people that we come in contact with. The third policing priority is property. A proactive media release was sent out in May just reminding people to lock their doors and not leave their vehicles running with keys in it. If uh, people in the community just did that, our property crime would go down significantly. So we try to throw out those reminders every once in a while, just lock your doors, don't leave the vehicle running. So uh, we're continuing work on the capture project, that being the community aided policing through the use of recorded evidence. Last week, I went out to Fort St. John and met with their detachment commander as well to see if we wanted to do a joint project with Fort St. John or keep it separate with Dawson Creek. So we're still working on that, but I expect that we're going to be moving forward with that, with that here in the next month. Community policing, we're still trying to arrange bike training for our officers. That five-day course is very hard to get apparently, but I think we've got our workaround and I expect to have officers on bicycles in the downtown core within the next two weeks is my hope. In May, I did have one more Zoom lunch with the school in the area. School's now done, so I've had, I think, about 12 Zoom lunches with schools throughout the School District 59 area. It was quite interesting and fun. Our, our detachment liaison participated in a community mental health committee meeting in May. They're planning some activities for fall. I did a media interview uh, speaking to bicycle safety and safe bicycling habits. We're still trying to line up some cultural training with Treaty 8. We're just waiting for Treaty 8 to identify a presenter, an elder that is available for us to, uh, to present to us. Uh, we also have a detachment liaison that's uh, 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 reached out to the Dawson Creek Sportsman Club. So we're going to start working out there with some of the shooters to promote safe shooting habits. And uh, we do have some other meetings arranged with them. The last policing priority is persons crimes. So we have a detachment liaison participating with the Int Intensive Case Assessment Team, or ICAT. If you remember, we're rolling that out in Dawson Creek right now. So we had three ICAT meetings in May. Planning is underway through the ICAT meeting for presentations to the attachment members and continued rollout, rollout of that program in our area. We're continuing our research uh, to uh, provide information to the community as to how someone might run a criminal records check on someone that you may want to get into a relationship with. So those resources are already out there. Uh, we're just preparing a media release to let people know how to do it and what's available to them. And finally, education consent presentation is currently being developed for schools and then we're planning to introduce that hopefully in the September school season. So that is all I have pending any questions for you today. Thank you, David. Any comments, questions from uh, Council? Uh, Councillor Earl. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Damon. Good to see you. Hope you're staying cool out there. Um, just a question with respect to the incoming versus outgoing detachment members. Um, experience level, are, are any of the incoming detachment members um, experienced? Are they fairly fairly green? Or no, we so we're, we're, we're lucky, actually. So we do have two experienced constables coming in, one of which just arrived a week ago. So he has about five years service. We have another member with over five years service from, coming from Connell. Okay. Two of the positions that are incoming are promotions. So they're going to be members, one of which is already identified. It's our new GIS corporal. He has over 11 years of service. Uh, so we have quite a bit of members with service coming in. Uh, that's good to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, further comments, questions for Damon? Damon, the uh, vacancy on your ops support sergeant, and it's been vacant for a period of time. Is that anything subdivision have given us direction that we can move forward with uh, replacing that position? Uh, I have been working with district and our staffing office in Prince George uh, almost weekly on that. So it's something that we're looking at uh, and to see what we can do for Good. that. So. Yeah. Thank you. Anything further? Councillor Parzal? I'd like to just talk a little more about the feasibility of capture project. Mm -hmm. So my understanding, Damon, is to policing through use of recorded evidence. So that would uh, be things like dash cameras, um, cameras at uh, traffic lights. Is that what No, not, not, not really what you're saying. Okay. Uh, so the, the capture project, uh, it was uh, developed, created, licensed, and copyrighted by the Red Deer RCMP. So they've developed a, it's just a website. 
and it allows uh, both residential and business customers to register their cameras on the website oh. uh, just letting the police know that we have cameras and if you want to use them for 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 crime uh, we're okay with that uh, there's no video footage on the website at all it's simply a registry for people that have cameras that will allow police access to them if we need it mm. so gotcha. for red deer for example they have if they have a crime occur in a particular area the detachment goes to the website they put the address in and they can see businesses and residences in the area that have cameras that may be, be of benefit to the investigation so cool and that could include dash cameras uh it's more geared toward residential and business cameras okay yeah, because dash cameras would be moving, so we wouldn't know the address. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And the, the person's crimes, uh, the very last bullet says education consent presentation. Yes. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, so just doing uh, presentations in the school about uh, what consent is and... You know that you know everybody has a has a has a has the right and the ability to say no uh, for touching, whether it's sexual or otherwise. Uh, so just making sure that we're in the schools talking to those groups that uh, uh, the the kids, the young teenagers, the young adults, uh, making sure they understand what consent is, both for 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 for. Um, uh, I was going to say males and females, but both so, you, so people understand what consent is, that everybody has a right to say no or uh, to limit their physical interaction or, or uh, with someone else. So, Thank you, Damon. Thank you, Charlie. Councillor, uh, anything further? Councillor, thank you, Damon. Appreciate you coming in this morning. Thank you very much. I think it's until October, so have a good time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have... Uh, is Marcel the fire chief? Okay, so if our deputies here. Good morning, Chad. Come on in. Welcome, Todd. Sorry, okay. I got you two always mixed up. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Thank Good you, morning. Everyone. Welcome. Yeah, through your worship, uh, Deputy Chief Todd Pickett. Uh, chief Capella is off today, so I'll give you a little presentation on what's going Fortuitous on. Fortuitous for him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just uh, we'll go over the calls of service here. So April we had sixty-seven, May forty-nine, uh, year to date of two thirty-four uh, inspections. April was sixty-one, May ninety, for year to date of three thirty-nine. Uh, things are starting to ramp up with less COVID restrictions and that kind of thing. So. Uh, training report, uh, total of 239 hours in April. Uh, a lot of that was due to um, EMR training uh, department-wide, so we had more training hours in April. And then uh, 188 in May for a total of 1869 year-to-date. Um, yeah, so some of the things that have been going on, uh, as I mentioned, the EMR training we did a lot of that in April, um, basically getting from a first responder uh, license uh, for medical up to an EMR level allows us just a little bit more scope of practice. A lot of departments are going that way. Uh, so we've been in talks with uh, quite a few of the departments, Prudence Rupert Terrace, for example, they're all switching over to that, uh, that licensing protocol. Um, we had to do quite a bit of training uh, on that and then also a written exam and what's called a jurisprudence exam uh, to basically find where all the codes are in the book and all the all the members have got through that we were scheduled to do some uh, the practical exams early May and then with the latest restrictions from health areas the EMA licensing board postponed that on us so we're still still waiting to do the practicals, but uh, actually, just recently, we've we were able to secure uh, short-term licenses, temporary licenses. Basically, they're kind of giving us a, a bit of a grace period there. So, so that's where that stands. Um, so, at the end of April, we took the uh, re backup rescue tools out of FD8. FD8's a, a long box pickup that we have with a canopy on it. In the winter time, we put uh, spare rescue tools on it just uh, in case motor vehicle accidents, that kind of thing, when there's uh, more than one on the go. And then in the summertime, we take that 
that uh, those tools out and we put a brush skid in it, which uh, is a 200 gallon <clears throat> portable water tank with a little pump and uh, just allows us better access to some of the areas where there's some brush and grass fires. So, um, so we had some of that uh, early, but uh, since things greened up, it's been a little slower, but as everyone's aware, the, it's getting pretty dry again. So hopefully that doesn't ramp up too much. Uh, in May, we had some joint uh, training with BC Forestry at the airport grounds, just burning off the long grass out there. Um, so that was a good experience for both parties. Uh, in May as well, we did uh, toes testing department-wide, so all the crews were divided up and uh, all the all the hose that we have in inventory, they, they test it, pressure it up, <clears throat> and uh, make sure it's all still good to go. Uh, auxiliary training commenced in April again after some COVID delays, lengthy COVID delays. Um, so that's been going on pretty steady since then, uh, since mid-April, so. Um, yeah, and then uh, just probably lastly, we got uh, we did a video for the schools as the weather got nicer and usually April, May into June, the schools start to do some field trips where they walk over and, and do some tours of the fire hall or we go to the schools and give them a presentation. But due to COVID protocols again, we weren't able to do that. So we made a video of just kind of who we are, what we do, that kind of thing, gave it to all the schools and uh, seemed to go over pretty well. So Good job. Yeah. Questions, comments? Um, yeah, congratulations on the video. I saw it and I thought they did a great job and oh. it was really, really uh, a cool, I think, uh, initiative for uh, the guys to, and gals to take part in. So good job. For sure. Thank you, Your Worship. I guess that's it. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks for coming right. in. Thank you. Uh, airport, uh, airport manager is Rowan here. Good morning, Rowan. Welcome. Hey, Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right, I'll just jump right into it then. Uh, so, uh, for the airport, um, I'm working with Blair for the strategic initiative for this year for the, the regional airport. So, uh, since we're approaching halfway through the year, I'll put together the medevac stats for 2021. So, we'll be able to reference that uh, in our next meeting for that initiative. And um, uh, nothing is final yet, but things with Pacific Coastal are looking very positive. Um, we've had a couple of meetings in the last few weeks, and um, while the final decision hasn't been made yet, it's likely, and I don't want to make a full commitment to that yet, but it's very likely that the um, uh, the September 8th date that they've given us will actually be the launch date. So uh, in the next couple of months, we'll be working with them just to make sure that everything uh, is in order and um, uh, just sorting out the final details with them. So. Uh, the second I hear any definitive news, whether another delay or they'll actually call and say this will be the actual date for the launch, I'll let everybody know as soon as possible. But for right now, it's very, 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 very fluid. Um, even with respect to the schedule, um, I think the original plan was seven days per week daily service to Calgary. But just with the industry as it is right now, the schedule is very fluid. So tentatively, we're looking at four days per week. But like I said, that could be subject to change. Um, we could be at September 8th and they bump it down to two. So we have to be very flexible with them and uh, we'll be very responsive to uh, any updates that they give us. So like I said, it's it's super fluid right now. So I couldn't tell you either way um, if the launch is going to happen. But with the last few meetings in the last couple of weeks, it's looking very likely that you know, we'll have some very good news come September. Uh, and um, just a couple of regulatory updates. Uh, we finished our review of the emergency response plan, but... Uh, as the effects of COVID-19 still uh, are felt, especially by the aviation industry, um, we're going to have to postpone our full-scale exercise. So uh, per our regulatory requirements, that's due every four years. So we were due for a full-scale, but with uh, we can't have quite a meeting of that size. So, so during the full-scale, during the full-scale, there could be potentially 150 people there at the airport at, at its peak, and with the meeting requirements or with the 
the gathering restrictions we have right now. That's just not possible right now. So uh, Transport Canada is aware of that. So they've been very proactive in uh, addressing these issues. So they have issued an exemption. So uh, I'll be exercising that exemption for the airport. So come uh, next year, 2022, we'll be having our full scale. So a requirement for us to get that exemption is to hold a virtual tabletop. So uh, that should be very possible. Uh, when I was reviewing the emergency response plan, a lot of the emergency organizations in Dawson Creek were very receptive to that. So it's looking that sometime probably early this fall, we'll be having a virtual tabletop just to satisfy that requirement for the airport. Uh, and besides that, we're just, uh, the biggest news is the the Pacific Coastal slash WestJet Link launch. So like I said, that'll be very fluid, but that's kind of the, the big thing for us this year is getting that service up and going. And we're doing everything we can with the, the airline to make sure that we're doing everything we can on our part to help them with that launch. And um, Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Ron. Mm -hmm. Questions, Council? Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and hi, Rowan. Thanks for good to see you. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, I think the the fact that we're finally looking at getting this WestJet launch going is phenomenal news. I just, I, I guess, uh, question, uh, but also kind of just out of interest, what um, are, are we engaged with um, local? Tourism, are we working with travel agents, stuff like that? Do you have the support you need to effectively help market and promote this initiative on behalf of the airport and WestJet? Um, and if there's something else that can be done, what is it? Just because I want to, I, I think uh, we're all aware of, of how invested we are as a city in the success of this initiative so i want to make sure we don't leave any stone unturned mm -hmm. so we uh just westjet i'll just uh, jump in westjet uh marketing just contacted me on friday um they because they haven't officially as rowan's indicated there's still the logistics of getting everything put into place it hasn't officially been announced of a uh, launch date and all of that and so we're still working our way through that westjet marketing just reached out to me friday and we have a call this afternoon with them um, to be able to begin that uh, discussion about marketing and uh, all of the work that will take place now over the next couple of months. It's just tough to go out until mm -hmm. we get all those. And, and it's primarily prim, uh, primarily Pacific Coastal and WestJet who will be working out uh, this new service. And, and once they have that in place, then we'll begin the marketing campaign. Yeah, no, I know. I, that's good to know. The reason I asked is simply because in talking with people throughout the community, now that... Uh, they're, they're, people are cautiously optimistic around COVID uh, reopening. I know a lot of people who are looking, who are booking trips or who have booked trips, and I just want to make sure um, we're we're not m losing out on on that traffic. Um, so, uh, just something I wanted to um, touch on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dvekov. Yeah, I was uh, actually trying to book a trip with WestJet from Dawson Creek the other day, and that you can book. Uh, I was booking for December. So is that official or is that not official then? So, no, we, we are, through our discussions and uh, with them is the launch is uh, beginning, uh, will, service will begin in uh, September 8th. Okay. And the flights seem to, uh, they're the same every day and they land in Calgary around five o'clock or something. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, pretty consistent. Yeah, uh, through your worship, I, it would be the same day every day, yes. Yeah. And, and like I said before, the schedule is very fluid. You can book seven days a week right now, currently starting September yeah. 8th. But like I said, if there is another delay, which is still likely given the, the global situation, I believe what they'll do is they'll give you a refund or give you an option to book at a later date. I believe that's their, their current process. Yeah. Councillor Dover. Uh, thank you, Worship. Thanks, Ron. Um, I just had a question. I know um, in Grand Prix, Flair Air just announced that they're going to be flying to uh, Toronto direct. I, like, is there things that promote Dawson Creek, like, out of this area? Like, I imagine they didn't know maybe Dawson Creek was here, but be, mm -hmm. Dawson Creek being central to, you know, the peace country, like, some of those bigger companies might be attracted here because mm -hmm. there's a more of a draw of people. Like, is there, like, do we promote outside or how do you get in contact with uh, them? Like, uh, through your worship, I, I believe there's a variety of factors with that. Um, Flair, I think, is, a, is an ultra low cost airline. So they, they advertise kind of on zero frills. 
Um, kind of the, the issue with starting up a service here is um, there, there's a lot of logistics involved with starting up um, air service to a community, to another community. Uh, part of that is ha what existing services are available there. So they might already have, I'm sure they have baggage contractors available in Grand Prairie and it's already a service and the more airlines that they're servicing, the lower the price will be. So it's just a matter of contacting Grand Prairie and asking them, what do your baggage handlers cost? The problem here is starting up that service. So right now there are no baggage handlers in Dawson Creek. So you, you have to, there would be a higher cost associated with that. So it, it's much cheaper to um, start up services at an airport that already has a lot of airlines coming in and out. So um, th that's part of the logistics problem. But as far as advertising, it's just a part of a, a regular initiative with, with airlines contacting airports and asking, you know, what if we were to fly there, what are your fee structures? And we've been very proactive with WestJet and with Pacific Coastal in saying that for the first year, your fees are waived. And that's a, a big incentive that the airport has to offer airlines that are coming in. So in terms of attracting different airlines, that I think that's an ongoing initiative for the airport is we're always reaching out. We're always ha we're very public with our fees and saying this is how much it would cost. So uh, that's just a uh, part of an initiative for the airport is just staying open to airlines when they contact us for information like that, where they're asking how much would it charge for this or what are your landing fees, what are your terminal fees, so they can work out on their end if it's enough of an incentive for them to move into that area. So that's it's an ongoing thing. There's a lot of factors involved with uh, okay. attracting a service like that. Yeah, no, I, I, would, I understand that for sure. So would a company like that, what have they contacted the Dawson Creek Airport? Uh, there, there's two ways they could contact us or we can contact them. I think um, the work that uh, my predecessor, Rick, did was very helpful in terms of getting the West Jet Pacific Coastal Service up and going before Central Mountain Air pulled out of the airport. So that would be, that's always a priority for the airport is seeing who can come in and who is interested in, in starting up service in Dawson Creek. That's, that's an ongoing initiative for the airport fairly well through the whole year. Thank you. And we built the, uh, sorry, Councilor Parcel, go ahead. Yes, I just uh, wondered if uh, there's a, a price point uh, articulated for this flight from Dawson Creek to Calgary. Uh, if Councillor Javatroff has been making bookings, what, what is the price? Return airfare? Councillor uh, Jericho? I, I was connecting to Las Vegas, so I don't know oh, the price. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. The price I uh, looked at, it was uh, very, very competitive with Grand Prairie's uh, costs. So. Okay. Just on, on the uh, air travel, um, it seems I was inquiring into flights, um, WestJet uh, to Kelowna as an alternative to driving. And I was astounded at the price, a uh, return fare. I guess I think I was booking that out of Fort St. John. Um, and uh, is it fair to say that at this time um, there are no, no real deals on air travel? It's, it's all quite expensive? Oh, uh, through your worship, uh, there's uh, a variety of deals going on right now. I know WestJet, okay. uh, the price will vary if you try to book a WestJet flight from uh, Dos Creek to Calgary. I think they're having some kind of like a 20% sale. That it's, the sale will vary. They're really encouraging people to be flying right now. So it really depends on which destination you're going to, what time, what date, and how close to the booking date you're actually. You're always going to get the best deal if you're booking a couple of months ahead of time versus booking a flight for next right. week. There's always a premium when you're booking a flight last minute like that. So, um, and if you're going from uh, uh, Fort St. John to Kelowna, um, I'm not sure which airline you're looking at exactly, but yeah. it, it really depends on the airline. I know yeah, I was looking at WestJet. I was just yeah. surprised how expensive it was. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, uh, I think it was about 680, something yeah. like that. Now, just with Flair, uh, Councillor Dober's questions there, isn't it another big factor for... Uh, our airport is that uh, with the way things are vis-a-vis -vis insurance and so on, that we are limited as the size of plane that can land here. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, through your worship, um, I, I, I couldn't speak to that right now. I'll have to talk to finance in terms of wh how, what our insurance covers. But if you'll remember, uh, last year we had a, a, a HERC land at the airport like uh, earlier 
uh, this year. So it's, it's, I don't think, uh, I would have to c come back to you on the insurance portion of that. Okay. That's not my area. I would have to talk to finance yeah. before I could yeah. speak yeah. to that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ron. And uh, on the um, on this the the business case that was built for uh, that w we convinced WestJet to come here was built on the industry and the amount of industry that was located here and working here was really what gave them the data to say there's a viability of uh, passenger loads here that we were able to put together with all of the folks uh, traveling into Dawson Creek. They weren't they weren't interested in trying to pull the passengers from Grand Prairie that they already have, or Fort St. John to here. It was new passengers, and that's how we built it. And so um, we're very excited about this opportunity. So thank you, Ron. Appreciate you coming in this morning. Thank you. Uh, next up, our safety coordinator. Good morning. Welcome. Your worship, members of council, good morning. Um, I'm here to give a brief um, report on health and safety. So for um, the month of um, May, June, the position, of, the position of the safety coordinator was revised to become the health and safety manager um, by senior management. So for our Josh committees, we continue to have our Josh committees. Josh is the Joint Occupational Health and Safety Committees, and we have five. Um, in our workplace, so they continue to assist with the health and safety department with um, different um, um, safety programs. Some of the programs in the past have been the day of mourning, and um, 12 new Josh members have been rotated through that program in between 2020 and 2021. And um, the co-chairs and members are working towards um, achieving the um, certificate of recognition by BCMSA um, training. The health and safety department had trained um, 20 Josh members. Um, every Josh member is legislated to, every new Josh member is legislated to go through some certain training. So we've done that. And um, some of the trainings we've done in the past two months are office ergonomics, uh, musculo musculoskeletal disorder, and then fall protection. Fall protection is a recurring cause for um, some of our work workers in the city. Um, COVID-19 updates, um, we're waiting for phase three, which will make definitely come just in, in a few days, um, July 1st. So what we are actually waiting for is that transition from the COVID-19 um, safety plan to a communicable disease prevention plan. That's what WorkSafeBC wants us to work on. And um, hopefully um, before, the, um, before the end of the day today, we're expecting something from WorkSafeBC. Um, the Josh committee, I mean, sorry, the certificate of recognition, the city has engaged the services of Glacier Consulting for that um, service. And um, the, the audit will be between September 13 and um, October 1st. So hopefully we, I, I, I'm sure that, I'm sorry, all, all hands are on deck. And um, last week we had this um, presentation by um, the general manager and safety manager um, to senior management and every other level of management. Um, incident um, report, we continue to keep health and safety statistics and um, as, recorded by, as recorded and submitted by the workplaces. So for the month of May to June, we had um, seven reported, um, reported incidents. Thank you. Yinka, thank you for that. Uh, Council, questions, comments? Um, so obviously, uh, Yinka, I think this, uh, uh, the entire aspect of health and safety sometimes um, can, be, can almost be taken for granted. And I don't think the appreciation of uh, really how important it is for us to have a culture of workplace safety. And we talk about it that, you know, everybody deserves to go home safely every day and us emphasizing how important health and safety is in our workplace. And, and you only have to look at it, how, how it significantly it impacts us when we lose employees because of an injury or an illness. And so thank you for your work that you're doing uh, for the city in and, and this regard. And 
and sincerely we appreciate it. It's um, it, it's you've done a great job for us, and I I, I want to recognize that. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Stay uh, stay cool out there. Uh, Sixteen point six. Our director of infrastructure. We have oh, there is the. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. How you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> Welcome, morning, everyone. Okay. So, uh, this is my first, I think, report as director of infrastructure. It's nice to have you here as director of infrastructure. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. So I'll go through quickly. It's an, it's a long report, uh, eight pages or so, but there's a lot of stats. I apologize for not getting the water environmental stats out to you the last uh, few months, but that was a little bit of work coming in, uh, cleaning up, so I got that to you now. I'm going to touch on a couple things. The ditching request for quotation results. Um, PC oil filled was the lowest bidder, $6 per lineal meter. They have started already, and they've done some work in Michaels as well as 99th Ave areas. We are looking to expand that program. Uh, it came in with a budget of about $60,000, and we budgeted $100,000 for the, for the operations. So uh, in previous years, usually we ditch every year, and the, but in previous years we've used those monies for assisting on capital and to clean up some of the ditching that was identified in some of the master plans. So with that, we can expand that program a little bit and do more ditching and get more of our town cleaned up so that come spring we'll have less, less problematic events. Is that there? Um, <clears throat> I want to just touch on the 2021 water valve replacement. I actually accidentally put Napper Industries when it should be Napit, although I did talk in the blurb there. I apologize to Napit for spelling their name wrong. And that one is moving forward. On the public works programming side, uh, we have now 33 kilometers of line that's been flushed up to June, which is fantastic to see. Our sanitary flushing program, actually our, our truck is out today. As well as, I want to touch on a couple of things for public works side. Uh, you'll notice, you may notice going through town that some sidewalk panels have heaved. They tend to pop into little, um, little mountains all over the place, and that is because of the heat. Usually, we see every year in the, the first heat wave of the year, those sidewalk panels will heat. They, they'll heat and pop. Um, I don't have a full explanation for that. On my engineering days, I looked into it. Um, but at the end of the day, we're going to make sure that there's no trip hazards. So Public Works is identifying them today, and they're going to go around with the backhoe tomorrow and try to possibly knock them down. But unfortunately, the reason they pop is because the, the, the concrete's expanded, so we actually have to remove one or both panels and repour them. So there's quite a few that have popped in this heat wave, including a couple downtown. So we're taking care of those today. We've identified them. I'm actually leaving from here to go look at one right after this. And then in the heat, on the heat, Public Works is uh, making sure that our guys aren't working too... Uh, too crazy in the heat, so we're avoiding any non-essential hot work. Uh, we've provided everybody with water and Gatorade, um, as well as the G20 for even our our members of the public, our members of our employees that can't have sugar. And we reduced our shift in the heat, and we're we're making them take lots of breaks, and we're actually bringing them back and doing doing some things inside in air-conditioned units or air-conditioned trucks or buildings. And water wastewater treatment programs. We've had quite a bit of staff turnover in the, at the water treatment plant recently, as you're aware. So we have hired, I've been very busy, and I've got four new staff that are starting this month. I've already hired in three of them. The next, the fourth one starts on Monday. I've had one start every week. And we've had some assistance from Fort St. John. We've had a relief operator from Fort St. John come down. Uh, one, or, one or two of their supervisors. Fort St. John has been very generous in providing that. So, uh, like, many thanks to them. And hopefully we can help them out whenever they need something from us. And we're just looking to get them up to speed. By September, I plan to be back to normal. Um, very quick program. I was very upfront with all of our new hires that uh, they're going to be coming into it and we're going to be building a team. And they're all very excited. So welcome to Jesse, to Josh, to Tyler, and to Eddie. <laughs> And as I mentioned before, I did include the water environmental stats for this cow. I apologize for not getting it to earlier. I wanted to make sure I got it to you before we take a bit of a hiatus from the cows for the summer. So you can see those in the back. If you have any questions, um, I'll leave them to you. Thanks, Devin. Any questions, Council? Great job. Uh, Councilor Javekov, go ahead. So the new guys that you hired, are they qualified or do you have to train them? Yes, they're qualified. 
Yeah. I have two that are qualified level ones. I have one that's gone to school and he is qualifying for his OIT, which is a operator in training. I have another one that's just finished his school and he's operator in training as well. All sure. of them have experience in water and wastewater treatment. So are they from away? Uh, one's from the area and three of them are not. <laughs> so they didn't have a problem coming to Dawson? And no. They didn't, didn't have to increase their wages? <laughs> The industry is, is int the industry is really interesting. Um, in order to be, most municipalities are looking for level threes and level fours. They're looking for somebody that's worked for five years, but it's one of those chicken and egg things. If you haven't worked for five years, you can't get five years experience. Um, but I've found the level ones are more than qualified to, to learn, and that's really what we need is somebody to learn. And as an employer, I love having new to the industry people because I can mold them to my system and the way I want things done. Good. Thanks, Devin. Anything further from council? I was thinking about uh, the guys and the girls out on uh, working in the community in this heat and today, tomorrow and Wednesday, it looks like it's 40 degrees. So we really appreciate that, that, you know, we make sure they're safe and nobody wants to be uh, exposed to that heat working outside and uh, having a health issue. So we appreciate you taking that initiative, Devin. Yeah, no worries. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Parslow, one, sorry, Dave, oh, yeah, Devin, correct. we just said Councillor Parslow. It's just a question, maybe to, to staff, because I'm sometimes confused who's responsible. You may not be responsible for this. Uh, the, the, the boulevards in town, you know, I'm thinking in front of Original Joe's, uh, that, who's responsible for that? Is that your area, Devin, or yours? Okay. Okay, thank you. So I well, don't have a question <laughs> for you, Devin. Right. <laughs> Devin's responsible to walk for Thank the you. water. <laughs> no, no. Thanks, Devin. Uh, 16.7, the uh, report from our development services manager. Ah, good morning. Morning. Welcome, Bill. Thanks. Uh, so I'll be presenting the Committee of the Whole report for development services for me. Uh, staff applied for the Union of BC Municipalities Local Government Development Approvals uh, Program Grant for 194000 in grant funding. If awarded, the grant would uh, cover the costs of updating the city's development procedures, manual and content, developing a downtown development strategy and action framework, and uh, reviewing and updating our development cost charges by law. Um, we anticipate getting a funding decision regarding the grant in early uh, August of this year. With building, um, we had a few applications in May. Um, Lord Coe's uh, project resume work. There's an anticipated completion in late July. BC Housing's uh, completing their civil works, anticipated completion of uh, September, September for that. Bylaw, moving on to bylaw, they continued uh, to investigate complaints and prepared for uh, tall weed and grass checks uh, starting in June. Uh, in regards to recycling, uh, I just want to give council an idea of how that auditing uh, process works. So it's a, it's a concerted effort with um, our bylaw department, waste management, and uh, the auditors who are the OBER. So on recycling weeks, they uh, OBER is out there doing the audits. So they'll go and look at bins, and if there's contaminants in there, they'll turn the bins and tag the bins. They take a picture of the contaminants in the bins, a picture of the bin with the number that's associated to the owner, and then a picture of the house as well. So they give that information to bylaw. Uh, we get it about between noon and one each day, and then bylaw goes and either gives notices, uh, like warnings and an educational component, or with the blatant stuff like food wastes, uh, yard waste, needles, diapers, construction waste, we give a fine right away on that. So um, a few things we've enhanced with that program is the first week during recycling, the bins would be tagged and turned so the driver doesn't pick them up. Uh, a few homeowners were pulling the tags off and turning them back. So what we've done is uh, the auditors are texting the driver the address of the bins that have been turned. So try to mitigate that. It doesn't make sense to give the tag, turn the bin, and then the owner just turns it. It kind of mitigates the whole idea of doing the audit. So we've done that. And then, so the driver doesn't pick it up. 
And if the driver notice for waste management notices that the bin tag has been uh, turned and the tag's been pulled off, he writes that down and gives that information to bylaw. So in the two weeks we've uh, done the auditing, we've given nine fines out. I think we had four fines in one day last week. So um, hopefully you get the contaminations down. So moving on to engineering, uh, they began preparation for the 2021 construction season. They continue to administer the asphalt and concrete patching programs. They prepared and awarded the 2022 to 2025 geotechnical assessment uh, request for quotations. So um, that uh, RFQ um, will provide a summary of the existing conditions and a recommendation for road structure for each project. Uh, we received four bids and uh, Tryon um, Engineering submitted the lowest bid at $29,975. Uh, other than that, we posted for the building inspector position and planning uh, positions. We're doing interviews next week, and we're looking to fill those vacancies and build some capacity. Mm -hmm. Thank you, department. Bill. Yeah. Any questions, comments? The only one for me is um, and is the um, water restrictions that come into play in May first, and so we part of our planning and part of our development of community was to implement a water uh, restriction and water use policy. And so odd number addresses water on Thursday and Sunday and evens Wednesday and Saturday. And it was about conservation of water. But now that we're in a position where we are, and to me that we are, I'm going to use the world of abundance that we have available in storage. Um, has that ever been a consideration that for us to move uh, and relax some of that? We, if we use more water, we people pay for it, understand they're going to pay for it. We make more revenue as a result of it, and we have the capacity to be able to do that. So I guess it's not to Bill, but more to Kevin and Blair as a comment that have, has that ever been a thought for us now that we are, have built the system we have <laughs> out of the blue? <laughs> <laughs> Kevin? Uh, so three, Worship, uh, that's a good question. So as you're aware, the current bylaw that we have on the water, we call it water conservation because restrictions are, it's a very <laughs> negative tone. Uh, water conservation measures was developed by um, quite a different council at a quite a different time under quite different circumstances. We didn't have, um, you know, South Dawson Reservoir. Uh, we were going through an extended period of drought. Um, industry was um, taking a, a significant portion uh, of, of potable water for industry uses. A lot of those things have changed. Um, uh, at least two of them have changed. Industry is not taking nearly as much potable. They're, they're using reclaim or other sources. Uh, we now have significant storage. The drought thing, I'm not sure that we might not be moving into another cyclical yeah. drier time, but... Um, so from a staff perspective, I would say, no, we haven't really considered that. Um, but f I mean, that's something that council could certainly consider and look at under different circumstances that we sit today. Yeah. I, I guess to me, it just is a, you know what, if, so if in the summer months, because people want to water their grass and water more, um, so we bump that consumption up by 20% or 30% or 50%. Uh, for that two months or three month period, it certainly wasn't going to jeopardize the supply capacity that we have w within our storage system. And in five months, six months, you got fresh at coming that's going to give you the opportunity to reach. Re re and, and we make the revenue off the utility to be able to keep our water res our revenues uh, stronger. And so to me, it's just a, a comment, a thought that I, and I, I understand when the conservation was put in place. We were in a different place, but having that kind of capacity available today was it is it something that uh, should be a topic? Blair, your worship, following through on that and that discussion, is this something you would like uh, brought back before council for consideration? Or, I mean, we're certainly open to anything yeah. like that. You know, for me, as a, I, I take a, you take some pride in your 
curb appeal you want to make your so i watered like crazy on thursday because i knew i was going the hot water weather's coming my grass is dry right and i got to draw water for another three days and it's going to be dry dry and you some of it you never recover from and i got thinking about it right we're we're strong in our supply uh of our reserves and um is that something we should be considering it was a it was just a thought <laughs> player well we can do some work on it. I'll work with Kevin, and okay. we can uh, bring something back for if council would like to uh, review that policy. Excuse me, <laughs> through your worship. Um, if that is a direction from council, it could be a motion brought forward to the next meeting. Yeah, I'll have to bring it back to the next meeting. This is just committee of the whole and just yes. for discussion, right? So. Correct. Councillor Parzel? Isn't there some provincial requirement that we have a, a stage, two, stage one water conservation? Every municipality. Kevin? So through your worship, uh, that, that's a very good point, and it's something that we would have to look at if we want to explore this, is the Water Sustainability Act yeah. requires municipalities to have a conservation plan. Um, and I don't know off the top exactly whether we're, you know, we're, we're exceeding that or we're meeting the bare minimum, but it's something that we would need to look at before contemplating changes, as there may be, you know, other implications that we haven't considered at this juncture, you know, with permitting and, and otherwise. Well, the mayor is perfectly correct. We're in a much different position than we were. But I'm just drawing on something I attended about uh, water at UBCM, perhaps. But, uh, but I think the mayor's point is very valid. So I'm not speaking against it. I'm just saying we may have some provincial things to, to cross. Sure. Thank you. Councillor Earl? Thank you, Your Worship. And while we're we're ruminating on the subject, something just occurred to me. Um, Poos Coopy, is their water conservation plan comparable to our own? Kevin, sorry. Yeah. So through Your Worship, yes. Okay. Um, when we developed our conservation bylaw, we in concert with Poos, um, yeah, they okay. mirror what we do. So that's something to take into consideration if we're going to consider revisions as well. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Thank you uh, for that, and appreciate you coming in this morning. And next up, we have uh, our f report from Financial Services Manager, 16.8. Yeah, hey, she's coming. She's coming. Oh, good morning. Welcome. Thanks for coming today. Okay. Floor is yours. <laughs> Just a few notes for the uh, Committee of the Whole from the Finance Department for the May June. Uh, permissive sales tax deadline was the applications was dead, uh, not dead, but deadline was June the 18th. 39 applications for uh, Schedule C, 20 applicants for Schedule A, place of worship. 15 out of the 59 are showing interest of the delegation pro process with council. Tax department this month, as of Friday, there was 2,306 homeowner grants collected, 1.9 million. Total, as of the 25th, was 13.4 million collected. That's 49%. Um, clerks have been very busy explaining the provincial government homeowner grant process. Um, and we did receive notification that the Royal Bank is, this will be their last year they're going to pay for homeowner taxes. So next year there will probably be about 150 to 180 customers that that affects. Wow. Uh, asset management certificate, certification, there was two finance employees taking the eight week asset management course, both received their certification. We posted the job on June the 18th and we're glad to say that one of them applied and got the job. Disaster financial assistance from the flood of 2020. Uh, we received our final payment on May the 26th, so that closes that file for last year. Uh, rural water sales. There was 409 customers in May, 103 between May 17th and the 21st, and an average of 18 people per day. Cemetery department. Uh, in the month of May, there was 22 permits issued for plot, interment, and memorial markers. And that's it. Well, thank you, Michelle. 
Questions, Councillor Dober. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Um, just one question: When you're saying the Royal Bank, uh, I'm assuming they just don't want to pay for people's yeah. property taxes. Are we looking at something, or are we even able to have like an online program where people? Well, we've can talked do that? about it. In just our clerks, we think we're going to send out pre-authorization forms and a letter to all those Royal Bank customers. Okay. To see if they want to sign up for the pre-auth payment. That makes sense. And I was just thinking too, because you said the clerks have been very busy. Like, I mean, even when I'm paying my own property tax, it'd be nice just to be able to do it online. Are we looking at something oh, like that for everybody? Where you, you can paying? do it online right now. Oh. Yep. <laughs> it's all online. It all of it's online. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. just wanted to come in and say hi to everybody. <laughs> um, Forty-nine percent of applied homeowners grants is no. Forty-nine percent of taxes collected. What's the completion of? Oh, so it's forty-nine percent of those have applied for homeowners grants. No, uh, the, twenty-three hundred and six have got their homeowner grants, and that's one point nine million. But total taxes collected, including all of it, homeowner grants and, yeah. is thirteen point four. Towards our taxes. Okay. So do we have, have we got any sense at all or is it hard to get a sense at all in terms of how residents are understanding the online process for a uh, homeowner grant? Mm, it's, a lot of them like it, but a lot of them don't read the insert. So they're walking in, opening up their tax notice, not realizing yeah. they don't even have to be at City Hall. They yeah. can just do it online. Yeah, the worry obviously I think for all of us you transition to this new process is people come in July 2nd yes. on the last day or whatever the day is to pay and apply for their homeowner grant and realize they got to try and get online and do it and may miss that deadline as a result of it, right? Yeah, but the deadline's not till August. Yeah, so, so hopefully. They have time. Good. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. Any further questions? Councillor Parslow? Nope. Sorry, I got first. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I got Councillor Javetkoff first. Yeah. <laughs> the permissive tax appli applicants, were there any that didn't apply? I think all of them applied. They all applied? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Jovetko, or Councillor Parzl. I don't have a question for Michelle, but I do for Flavia, um, if I may. Absolutely, yeah? yes. Okay. Flavia, have you had any notification yet on the magnitude of the retroactive pay increase for the RCMP? Not yet. Okay, I can we give you a figure. I'll give yet. it to you privately. You might be, I'd like you to be seat, seated, seated when I give you the figure. Yeah, but I do have, uh, in the last two, three years, we have been receiving a suggested accrual amount, which we have been doing faithfully. So in a way, we are protected through the accrual for this um, okay. potential payment that's coming. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Flavie. Um, anything further for Michelle? <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Michelle. Thanks. Have a good day. Yeah. And 16.9, uh, our corporate officer. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few uh, highlights from my report. Um, First of all, we've seen an increase in the number of freedom of information requests being received by the city in the past about uh, one or two per year. And so far this year, we're currently completing our seventh. Um, so far, we've been able to provide all the information before the 30-day deadline. But um, if necessary, we could apply for an extension if um, workloads warrant that. And I just want to thank Joe for keeping uh, us up to date on these so far. Secondly, uh, we're back into staff training with a new hire, uh, Kim Noseworthy. Kim has recently relocated from Newfoundland and has joined our admin team in a six-month term position to cover medical term vacancy. And we're really excited to have Kim on board with us. She's not here today, and, or otherwise I would introduce you all to her. Uh, next, the loan authorization bylaw that was permitting um, borrowing for the capital roads, we've received uh, approval from the ministry, so we're able to move forward to our public notification stage. Anyone that's opposed to the borrowing that of $20 million over a four-year period for capital road improvements can complete an elector response form. 
The deadline for submitting these forms is Monday, August 9th, after which time Council will be able to consider adoption of the bylaw. As long as less than 10%, which is 917, of the eligible electors submits a form, then, uh, then Council can proceed to adopt that bylaw. Notices will be placed in the paper and City will also use social media to inform citizens regarding this, their intention to borrow. And although the 20 million seems high, the capital plan is to borrow 5 million per year over four years. And as the loan authorization bylaw is quite lengthy, approving the entire 20 million at one time allows construction to begin much sooner every year. And lastly, I just wanted to highlight in uh, assistance to the regional district, um, they've asked us to assist in promoting their assent voting scheduled for July 17th. The proposed new service that will affect residents of Dawson Creek would provide grants and aid to not-for-profit societies to enhance the quality and availability of health-related services and to provide scholarships to students seeking post-secondary education in a health care or medical field. And I don't have any more information on that, but more will be coming from them beginning July 2nd. Thank you, Brenda. And that's all the information I have. Comments, questions? Councillor Parslow. I'm just curious about the freedom of information in a very general sense. What, what sort of areas are people uh, requiring information about? Um, in a general sense, the majority are fire-related um, insurance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. On the um, PRD um, uh, assent uh, votings, the um, in July 17th, the one that the city is, these are uh, what we did at the Peace River Regional District where we were doing uh, gr almost grant and aid or economic development type funding and so the st we give $170,000 a year through the PRRD to STARS for that service. We've given 120000 a year, I think or 110000 a year to health related, the scholarships, the South Peace Health Society, the Bolter Rice House, things like that are all within that envelope of health stuff and and it's uh, the way we were they were administering it wasn't proper under the bylaw and so this is why we're having the referendum there's about four of them going or three of them going I think in the region um, but this one is the only one that affects Dawson Creek get out and vote anything further for Brenda thank you Brenda so that gets us to the end of our open meeting and um, we have a few items to go into and closed. We didn't bring in lunch because we anticipated we would be done. We can adjourn and recess and go come back at one if you like or if you would like to finish closed and then you don't have to come back but you don't get lunch. We, we have donuts. <laughs> So if I could have a motion to recess to close for the purposes of agenda items 4, 1 and 5, 1, section 90 minutes and agenda items 8, 2 are under section 91 G litigation or potential litigation affecting municipality. Councillor Javakoff, second Councillor Earl, all in favour? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. So we'll adjourn for five minutes and uh, allow everybody to get packed up and then we'll go back into closed. <coughs>